Travolting presents The Fraser's Edge. Hosted by Jeff Sweeney and Stuart Elmore. Covering Killers of the Flower Moon. Enjoy the episode. Who's that? Hey, I'm from uh, Washington. Here to see about the, that Brandon Fraser podcast. Jesse Plemons? Uh, the one and only. Uh, what, what? Sorry, uh, I'm just a little shocked. What brings you here? Here to see about this Brandon Fraser podcast. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you have a seat? Oh, here, coming in. How could that possibly be profitable for free to lay? What? That's all I got for the bit. I'm cutting it off here. I, I went with you, and I was waiting for it to pick up some steam. Well, I was hoping you would say what he says in the movie. Um, I don't remember what he says in the he, movie. Jesse Plemons is like, here to see about the murders, and Leo's like, what about him? What, what who's doing him? Uh, the, goal, oh, the goal is I was going to say. That dial- I'm that, here just, to see about that Brendan Fraser podcast. Just do that dialogue scene. Oh, yeah. and what about the Brendan Fraser well, podcast? And I was like, well, see who's doing it, and then I was going to intro us because we're the ones doing it. You can't win them all. Welcome back, folks. Thank you for listening you, you really can't to our win. episode last week on Batgirl. <laughs> oh, my God. Batgirl was last week. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying our Batgirl episode. We hope uh, we really blew the lid off of that conspiracy. This week, we're talking about another conspiracy, um, but not the um, the insidious plot to keep you from watching Batgirl, but um, instead Martin Scorsese's um, most recent film. Yes. It came out two days prior to this recording. Two days. Um, so this is our first. Um, we've been on a little bit of a sabbatical. Yeah, we we've, we've took we've taken a little break due to some personal um, concerns, but we built up a backlog. So you guys have no indication of that. And for folks wondering personal concerns, I got a job at North Face. That's that's what it was. I need to get a job at North Face. So we yep. are back to no longer being well, one half of this being not unemployed filmmakers. Yes. Although I am an unemployed filmmaker. Yeah, you're, you're but I'm just not unemployed, unemployed otherwise. I'm employed somewhere else. Yes. Um, but no, this is the first time we've covered a movie that is fresh in theaters. Yeah. We've covered some Travoltas that are fresh in release. But they've never been theaters. Yeah, they've never been theaters. They like direct to streaming. They're movies that you have to like go to a shadowy corner at uh, 10 p.m. <laughs> and some guy like kind of comes around the corner and passes you. You have to DVD. knock on the red box like... Oh yeah, the red, and then box, the red opens. box opens and there's a man in the trench coat like, you here to buy some Travoltas? <laughs> buy some Mobland? <laughs> like, I got three Moblands for one, for, for one Paradise City. <laughs> oh my die god. Die hot? You want to die hot? But instead, we are not at that level with Brendan Fraser. No, because Brendan, um, as we've been talking about, has been in the beginnings of what is seemingly a career renaissance. Yes. He's kind of having, he's having a big comeback. A big comeback. Um, we talked about No Sudden Move. We talked about The Whale. We talked about Batgirl. Um, and then this is kind of, uh, I mean, he's not in this movie as much as he's in those other three. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's equal to No, no Sudden Move. Um, he's not in it as much. But this is kind of um this is the most prestigious thing I think he's been in since his the comeback. Whale. Like the whale was great for him. Um and Aronofsky is a very respected filmmaker. Right. There's this something is, specific about Martin Scorsese. Yeah, that, this is um, a Scorsese movie. Yes. It'd be the same if like, you know, you do like an A twenty four indie film and get win an Oscar and then yeah. you're on a Spielberg movie. Like, yeah. Like, the two aren't exactly the same. Martin Scorsese choosing to have you in his movie. And I'm and Scorsese picks based on talent. I don't think he picks based on clout. He's not picking people because like, oh, you're famous. You're having a moment. He picks people off of, you know, the talent and how they're going to fit the role he wants. And who's worked well with him in the past. Yeah, and who's worked well with him in the past. For this is, all of his, like, 80 Robert De Niro movies. This is done. his 10th Robert De Niro collaboration and 6th uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. And the first time they've worked together in one of his movies. Which I will say, like, we can go back and forth on, like, is it clout? Is it talent? And I think it's it's the combination of, like, he knows that they're good actors. Yeah. He knows that they'll take whatever role that, they, that you know, Whatever lands on the paper, they'll they'll make something out mm. of it. I just think it's um and for Brendan, it's kind of just very it's a very lovely coda to this um season of our show. Very that very very you know he's in a position in his career now where a guy like Scorsese sees his um talent and wants to use him in his movie. 
Yeah. And Brennan's being used in this movie. Like the, he has a specific role to fill in this movie. Um, this isn't a role where he's going to get an Oscar nomination. This isn't um, like a leading role. This is, he is a character actor fulfilling a purpose within the movie. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about it later. I think he fills that role with flying colors, I, specifically I, what he's being asked to do. Yeah. So for folks in the audience, I am coming to this recording session. Literally, it's current, It's 720 now. The movie, I just finished watching this movie an hour ago. Yes. At the movie theater that's like 10 minutes away from Jeff's apartment. I literally went there at 2.30. Set, I got there at 2.10. Yes. A thing I A thing uh, Jeff never, never do. does. But I like to get to the movie early and get my seat and I like get to comfortable. say that I like to get to the movie early and then never do. <laughs> See, that is what I don't know <laughs> how you make that funny. But anyway, um, and I, yeah, like, what, what's the runtime on it again? It's uh, three hours, three hours 26 and 26 minutes. minutes. So literally like 2.30, I got out at like 6.20. Yeah, yeah. Like literally an hour ago. I got, I got here at like 6.40 maybe. So you have an extremely fresh mind. Very, on very, very fresh. Which is usually the opposite of how we do. This is an opposite day. This is episode. an opposite day. Stuart and I are sitting on opposite sides of the table for the first oh time. Oh my god, this is like a complete polar yeah. opposite episode. Normally, I'm the one who watches the movie right before, and Stuart watches like the night before, or two days before. Yeah. Um, but now we flipped. I saw this movie opening day on Thursday, yeah. and he saw that today. Yeah. So if anything, I'll be a little. I mean, I remember this movie very well. I, I think. I'm honestly like. It's still soaking it in. Yes. So I might forget a lot of stuff. Yes. Because I'm still processing it yes. all. It's, it's a movie to be processed. Which is normally what happens when we record the other way. You Normally, yeah. I have to remind you plot points. Yes. And be like, no, 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 just, no, this happened. Because right after I watch these movies, usually I have like a list of things I want to mention, and I kind yeah. of miss the skeleton. Yeah. Um, which is will be incumbent on me today to... Uh, yeah. To keep that going. But I just watched the movie. Yes. I obviously didn't bring a notebook into the theater or anything like that. That would have been very funny if you would did. have been very funny. But well, no, well, there people was behind you like throw in tomatoes at right. you. Like, <laughs> they sell <laughs> tomatoes at the AMC New <laughs> City now. <laughs> uh, but there was one thing I wanted to mention, which was um, you mentioned that this is a great cap off for Fraser for us. And one thing that I wanted to say is like, it is, and it also makes me excited for the first one we do coming back. Yes. So we we haven't said what season three of the show is going to be yet. We may yeah. do that next week. Yeah, we'll talk about that next week. We'll let you know um, when we finish up with our kind of retrospective. Of but Brandon. when we ended Travolta going into Fraser and we hinted at the sneak peek of like, we will be staying with Travolta every movie that comes out afterwards, mm -hmm. we're going to go back and do. It was like a threat. That was a threat. <laughs> this is like a reward. This is a promise. This is a promise that I'm looking forward to because um, they casted Killers of the Flower Moon during 2020. Yes. Before The Whale came out. Yes. This is a movie that Fraser got, like Jeff just said, purely based on talent mm -hmm. and not on clout or like he wasn't, notoriety. He was in the zeitgeist only in the sense of like people were like, Having like a moment of loving Brendan Fraser again, because like, would would you say like, could could no sudden move had been like floating around while Scorsese was casting? Like, is I'm, that a possibility? I'm sure. Basically, what happened here is like the same thing that happened with No Sudden Move and The Whale, which is like he's having his like kind of a popular love being thrown at him. Yeah. Not that Mar Mars Scorsese is not on Twitter. He's not like but that's using why, social that's media. That's why I say it's like it lends even more to the argument that he's not being hired based on like popularity. But I, I'm sure like clout. his uh, his casting aide or casting director yeah. was just like looking at these roles and was like, oh, you know, Brendan Fraser, I'm sure Scorsese is like who has seen probably every movie under the sun. Yeah. I uh, was like, okay, he'd be great for that. Let me, he'd be great for that. For this one little role, like yeah. you're not trying to make him be like earnest or anything yeah. like that. Like, I don't think Scorsese would have gone for that, but yes. for that role of being like the defense attorney, like yes. I think that I, as thinking in Scorsese, she was like, yeah, I don't see yeah. why not. Like, he seems competent enough; yeah. he can fill that role. He saw all something right. in him, yeah, um, and yeah. decided to bring him into it. But to tie it all back around, that I am looking forward to the first movie we have to go yes. back to Fraser to cover because that's going to be the first movie that is. In all aspects of itself, the uh, aftermath movie. Well, the first thing we get to cover of the first, the next movie he's in, he was 
right now he's currently in the new season of Doom Patrol. Um, yeah. Which is apparently the last season of that show. He has a movie called Brothers coming out um, sometime within the next year, uh, which is a comedy starring him, Josh Brolin, and Peter Dinklage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's written by Macon Blair, um, who is a lovely guy. Um, and it's directed by the guy who did Palm Springs, which I really enjoyed as a comedy. So I'm looking forward to that movie. Yeah. Aside from that, he has nothing else in the pipeline that's been announced. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's okay. what I'm... I want to hear... I want to start seeing, like, what he's doing. Because I said this in No Sudden Move, but it's roles like this and No Sudden Move that I really want to see Brendan kind of just explode in. Yeah. I just want him to be the guy who pops up in a movie every year, and you're like, yeah, when he shows up. I literally... I shit you not, because not to bounce too far ahead. Also, we should say that because we are covering this movie, and it will come out... So we're, we're recording this on October 22nd. It won't come out this Friday. Yeah, this comes out November 3rd. So it's two weeks S- after release. So I guess we don't have to say spoiler alert, but maybe we should just say yeah. like this will be like a spoilers ep- like yeah. review. If, if you were planning on waiting for the Apple TV Plus release of this movie, <laughs> which is it is coming to Apple it TV Plus at the end of November. Apple TV Plus, yeah. Um, then maybe wait to listen to this episode until then. Yeah. Um, but if you saw the movie in theaters, which I highly recommend, if you... See it in theaters. See it in theaters. Um, go see please, this movie in theaters. Please see it in theaters. Um, it is definitely a movie that is... It's not just something that we want you to go see in theaters just because we like movie theaters. This is a movie that will benefit from being seen in a theater. I'm. You're going to throw tomatoes at me when I say this, but like, you're without a doubt much more of a movie theater stand than I am. Yes. Every time I've gone to a movie theater, Jeff, every time in, in the past, like, I want to say... I'm going to be generous yeah. and say three years probably been like five years yeah. but i'm gonna say every time i got on the movie in the past three years a cell phone goes off a baby cries an old couple starts talking mm-hmm. somebody trips off the emergency like i have yet to have like th- unless if i go by myself and it's three weeks after yeah. it's been released and nobody's in the theater like fresh releases typically tend to be like a letdown experience for mm-hmm. me typically i usually have a good time with um experiences and it's mostly because i i pick my seating very specifically yeah i try to as well but like i just and this is a fault of my own and not for anybody Mm. else i allow myself to get distracted very easily by the smallest annoying things and that that is perversely what what i really like especially about a movie of this length yeah is when i'm at home and if i put a three and a half hour movie on at home i am very liable to get distracted yeah um, I, it, it could be like my phone goes off. I pause the movie to look at the text and then I start scrolling and 10 minutes have gone by. I get up to use the bathroom and something distracts me there. When I'm in a movie theater with something like this, that is a very, you know, intensive project to watch. Yeah. I kind of want to be trapped with it. And that is why to that point, I just wanted to tell, like make my claim to the audience and say that for somebody who typically, I'm like 50-50 on do I see it in theaters or do I wait for streaming? Mm. I'm telling you, the audience, to go see this in theaters. Yes. Like even a person like me who is like very chill and low-key about whether you wait to see it in theaters or streaming, go see this in theaters, yes. please. Because I agree 100% with what you said. Like if you try to watch this from home, there's like a lot of slow moments that when you're at home it's going to feel slow, but when you're in the theater they're all yes. juicy. And... um. I'm not saying that makes the movie better or worse. I'm just saying like you're more pliable to pay attention to the theater. How, during those how did you feel about the pace of this movie? Because I did not feel like I was there for three and a half hours. There was one moment where I thought I, I clocked this and I was like, I'm going to tell Jeff this when we start recording. Mm-hmm. Um, this is gonna, this is a plot point I'm going to mention yeah. here. But after he's in um, jail... Yes. And he gets told that his daughter dies. Yes. And he starts crying. And then Robert De Niro like starts crying and like pr- pr- praying yeah. over him, all that stuff. There was a small, and then it cuts to like the graveyard. There was yeah. a small moment where I had, it's starting to drag a little bit, mm. but it changed because, because you know what I would yeah. up from like 20 minutes prior to that moment happening up until that moment, I started to linger the thought, man, I really want to go back to uh, Molly. Yeah. I really want to go back and to And then they character. go back to Molly. And they go back to Molly in that scene. So I'm like, well, I can't really co- make a complaint about it because the moment I feel like it starts to drag, they go to the person yes. I've been wanting to see more of. And if it's 
And if you're watching a three hour, 26 minute movie and you only start to think, oh, this is Dragon Bit, like three hours, three hours minutes, into the movie, then that's a very, that's a very that's a good great thing. Ex- absolutely. Because no point before that did I think it yes. was dragging. So the fact that that literally was like three hour, three hours yeah. and 10 minutes in the movie. You're right. Like that's yeah. that's a testament to the movie that I didn't feel it was driving yeah. until that point. That that is a totally justifiable point of time to start being like, all right, maybe we'll maybe we can start wrapping this up. And then the movie does wrap up. There's like 20 minutes left and it ends. Right. Yeah. Um, before we delve into the plot, um, where we'll get to talk more about this stuff specifically, I do want to talk about this the production of this movie Please. and how this movie got made. Please. Um, because it is a very interesting story itself. Yeah. Um, so I first became aware of this book. This is based on a book by um, David Graham uh, called Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm-hmm. I first became aware of it in 2016, I believe. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to, let me bring up when the actual book. 2017. Yeah. So the book came out um, April 18th of 2017. I worked at a bookstore at the time, and I got an advanced reader copy of this book in like February of 2017. Okay. And I just read it because I'm like, this seems like an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. So I read this book before it came out. I was like, good book. This would be an interesting movie. Lo and behold, the book comes out. Immediately there's an announcement. Martin Scorsese is going to make... Oh, no. Martin Scorsese announced he was going to make this movie the basically the same month the book comes out. Yeah. So, you know, I finished reading the book. I'm like, this would make a good movie. Book comes out. We start selling it in the bookstore, Matt. Martin Scorsese is making this movie. I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. He's a great choice for this, um, for epic historical um, Absolutely. Um, retellings. I don't want to say fiction. This is, you know, it's a fictitious retelling, but this is uh, based on true events. And can I make one quick little positive observation? Yes. Uh, I, 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 so have you, have you seen the wave of people who think it's now cool to dig on Scorsese? Yes. And because he at one point said something bad about Marvel. Yeah, he said they're like theme park rides. But guess what? Whether you you it, it's an argument to say whether he was right when he made the claim, but you cannot argue whether he's right now. Yes, because he if you look at where we're at now, he's a hundred percent correct. And trust me, I'm gonna be honest. I was also in that camp of like, fuck you, Scorsese. You don't say that about Marvel because at this point, like Infinity War, Endgame's coming out. But then you see where we're at today. I'm like, yeah. he was absolutely right. Yeah. Like, And like, even, you know, those mid 2010s Marvel movies, I don't want to linger on the Marvel thing because it gets blown out of proportion. Well, Scorsese doesn't really I, care that much about it. I didn't want to either. Yeah. I just wanted to make that kind of, like, that was my, like, entry to the point I was yeah. trying to make. That it's starting to become like a thing of, like, you know, young film students and even people have no yeah. fucking way, reason to talk about film who are also making this claim. But I only wanted to say this in the sense of, like, like, objectively speaking Scorsese will go down as one of the best filmmakers in cinematic history like from the moment film started to be used until where we are right now he is going to go down as like in the top three top four top five whatever and like and do I love Ant-Man I like Ant-Man the movie I think it's a very good movie I watch Ant-Man and I have a great time compared to um the breadth of Scorsese's work um, there's there's just not a comparison. To well, and then to go to like to swing in like the 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 impetus point I'm trying to make here. What I love the most about Scorsese, I don't love all of his movies, but I love most of them mm-hmm. is the subject matter he picks. Yes, it seems back to back like you can't predict what movie he's going to make in five years, mm-hmm. and I love that about him. And. You well, I can't say the same thing about Spielberg and you can't say the same thing about Tarantino, but Scorsese, it's like he can go from making what movie came out before Silence in 2016? The Wolf of Wall Street. Who in their right fucking mind would watch The Wolf of Wall Street and think the, that the next movie that guy's going to make is Silence? <laughs> yes, no one. No one. And that's what I love about Scorsese. All of his movies are unique, and the but yet the all kind of tap into some of the same ideas mm-hmm. that he's trying to do. And when we get a little more into the plot, because I think this movie is very much of a piece with Wolf of Wall Street, Goodfellas, Casino. Mm-hmm. It's very much putting you in the perspective of an American rags to riches story and then revealing how um, depraved that rags to riches story is. Um, yeah. Which is the same thing that Wolf of Wall Street's trying to do and mm-hmm. putting you in Jordan Belfort's shoes. And you're like, hey, this is great. And the whole time the movie's like this is kind of fucked up 
but we're not going to say that to you. You're going to have to figure that out. Um, and this movie, yeah. I feel like, is doing the same thing. But I digress. Yeah. Um, so this movie gets announced. Scorsese is going to do the adaptation. Leonardo DiCaprio and De Niro get announced pretty early um, as being involved in the project. Which, of course, of course. you could bet on that. Um, Scorsese's going to do it pretty quick at this point um, with shoot dates intended to be around like 2018, 2019 mm-hmm. um, after he finishes up The Irishman. Mm-hmm. Um, then it kind of stalls out for a bit um, due to funding issues. Right. Um, and also, and so Paramount um, at that point is considering funding it. But it's going to be like a $200 million movie. It's a very expensive movie. Yeah. And so all the while there's some financial issues. And then Scorsese starts looking at the material and starts having second guess. It starts doubting himself making this movie. Because mm-hmm. the book is very much... Basically, it's from the FBI's perspective. Um, oh. The book is about there's some murders, and then FBI Special Agent Tom White comes into Osage uh, territory to figure out who killed, uh, who's killing the Osage. Okay. Um, and Jesse Plemons plays Tom White in the movie, um, and he does not come in until I think two hours into the movie. The whole Ernest and Molly part is in the book, but it is not the main focus. Okay. It's just like it's a thing that the book is talking about. At this point, DiCaprio is gonna play Tom White, and he and Scorsese are talking. And they're just like, "This isn't. This is not the correct way to tell this story. This is the. This is a movie about a white guy who comes in and saves the day." Very true. Um, and it's, there's no, what. What is this movie saying about America? It's saying the FBI is great, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Well, that that's not interesting to either of us." Yeah. So Scorsese is like, "All right, I'm gonna continue working on the Irishman." Let's scrap everything that we've done, essentially. Go back to page one. What is the heart of this movie? Or the heart of this story? And they circle in on the fact that while this is all happening, there is a love story between an Osage woman, Molly Burkhart, um, and Ernest Burkhart, who is one of the um, men complicit in the murders. Mm -hmm. And that's a very fascinating dynamic. um, And just how much truth is being told there. Yeah. Um, how much is Ernest, does Ernest feel guilt? How earnest is Ernest? Yes, how earnest is Ernest? Yeah. And that's the thing that they really hone in on um, yeah. in their second attempt to write the script. And he never fully flips the coin to answer that question. Yes. Which, and that is perfectly, perfectly, perfectly shown in the final scene of the yes. movie. I'm so excited to talk about the end of this movie. Yeah, me too. Um, but at that point... um. They work on it. COVID happens. So he kind of takes the the forced breaks of funding issues and COVID to spend a lot of time in Osage territory. Mm-hmm. Um, he goes to a lot. Of, he meets with a lot of tribal leaders, gets a lot of their input on the script. They help him kind of develop the world of the movie. They help him with casting. He wants to very much make this movie in partnership with the Osage because it is an Osage story. Mm-hmm. Um, around. In the midst of COVID, um, Paramount does fully kind of drop out of funding this movie. Um, and then it gets picked up by Apple TV Plus, which is a very strange thing that Martin Scorsese's last two movies have been by streaming companies. Mm-hmm. But hey, if they're the people who will give him $200 million to make a movie, I say more power to him. Yeah. Um, they're giving Ridley Scott $200 million to make a, a crazy looking Napoleon movie next month. Can't well, wait. What's interesting about that is Ridley Scott has been talking since. Tell I'm not I don't I'm not quoting here so tell me if I'm wrong. Making a Napoleon movie since 2002, mm-hmm. he's been wanting to make a Napoleon movie yeah. for fucking decades. He's finally getting to do it. Yeah, and these streaming services are, um, and a lot of them are turning away from this now, which is a shame. But you know, you still have your apples that are very much kind of putting their money where their mouth is and funding passion projects. Yeah, for like veteran filmmakers. Yeah, right. Um, Can I say something that's interesting? Yes. Um, this book came out in 2016. 17. 17. Okay, even more so. Have you read or heard of the book that I've never read, but I've just heard a lot about Empire of the Summer Moon? I've not. It's uh, a, about a very interesting story about a woman who kind of more or less gets like adopted into the Comanche Native American tribe, mm-hmm. which from a American told historical aspect, Comanches are known as being like the barbarian like Native American tribes. Yeah nomadic never like staying in one place like and 
from what I've just heard about it, that it tells a very good, compelling story about it. That book came out in 2010. Yes. And when I heard about it, the first thing my thought is, is like, okay, who's going to make this into a movie? It's interesting that it hasn't been yet. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's even in the pipeline for anybody's wish list yet. But that being said, I just want to throw that out there because that's a very, very, very well-known Native American book that has come out like for it's been out for 13 years now and still I've yet to see any news or word of a it cinematic portrayal. It looks like at some point there was an announcement that Derek uh, uh, Sian France, I don't know how you say his last name, uh, guy who did Blue Valentine, Place Beyond the Pines, um, is going to do a movie of it, but there's been no news since. Yeah. Yeah. Just from like, I, I really should read it because I've heard really good things about mm. it but and it's got good history yeah and killers of the flower moon the book is is well worth a read if you i can loan you my copy if you have any interest in i'm reading. an audiobook kind of guy You're so. an audiobook kind of guy yeah um it is well worth a read if anyone listening is interested yeah but the there's a lot of um attention to detail put into capturing the spirit of history and these events correctly and this culture mm-hmm. uh, they filmed the movie in 2021 um it's a looks like a six month shoot um, it is a big movie, so it makes sense. It took a long time to film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it does end up starring both Leo and De Niro. And then the kind of third lead um, of those three, uh, Molly Burkhart, is played by Lily Gladstone. Lily Gladstone. Has a very lovely story that she at, was considering giving up acting. Yeah. She was taking data analytics courses mm-hmm. or signing up for them. Um, and while she was like on the page signing up for it, she got an email from her agent that Martin Scorsese wanted to meet with her um, and about a movie he's doing. Uh, she had, she's she been in a lot of like um, independent films like Kelly Reichardt's Certain Woman, First Cal. She's great. Um, but this is her big break and a big moment for her. Um, and that's just, it's really cool to see like a Star is Born performance in a movie. Well, and. Again, I'm, I'm I, I hesitate to say any like immediate knee jerk reaction thoughts that I have for, since I'm still absorbing just it. Just a Sam. But um watching this movie, not really having heard of Lily Gladstone, I'm thinking like, okay, what what movie was she nominated for an Academy Award that I've never heard of before? Mm-hmm. She cuz I think she is so yes. good in this movie to such a degree that I'm like, well, surely she's been like yeah. in tons of other things and she was probably nominated for she, something that I never heard of. But this is not her first movie, but it's like essentially her first like popular quote yeah, unquote popular that's movie. That's insanity. She's phenomenal. This movie. She's, I would say essentially the real lead of the movie. Um, there's like, yeah, in terms well, of POV, perhaps not, but she's the heart of well, the movie. Well, that's like the one thing I'm not ready to say whether it's a complaint or not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a discussion that it's we'll a discussion that we, you yes. and I are already on the same page about what yes. we want to talk about. Okay, continue. <laughs> um, but uh, that's basically all I have in terms of you know the production of the movie. There's mm-hmm. a million and a half behind the scenes stories you can find online about like De Niro like breaking his leg on this movie or mm, damn. Um, it was some muscle injury or X Y Z. There's a bunch of fun stories. We don't need to go into them. I mean, the fucker's 80 years old. Yes, so. he's old, so <laughs> it would make sense he would injure himself yeah. on a six-month film shoot. Yeah. Um, but this to, movie came out. To carry into the plot, but to also kind of tie in your thoughts, I love the way you were describing the fact that they, in the initial thoughts, the drafts of the script while he was working on The Irishman, that they didn't like this sort of yeah. POV style, so they wanted to scrap it and from page one figure out what is at the core of this yeah. movie. Well, as we start the very first movie, we understand what the core is. Yeah. It's the movie opens with uh, the Osage tribe yeah. mourning the loss of one of their tribal members. Well, they're they're mourning the loss of their language, essentially. Oh. Because they're, they're burying a ceremonial pipe. Got it. Um, and the idea being that this burying this pipe, um, they are burying a lot of their culture and that their children are going to grow up in English schools. Yeah. Learn English speech. um, I don't know why I didn't clock that. I thought it was uh, a person. I thought it was a person as well, but no, they're they're just burying the pipe. Okay. Um, So they're kind of burying their culture. I was a little bit confused because I was like, is it a baby? Is it something like I wasn't totally sure. But But that's even better. Yeah. That's so much better. They're burying a pipe and then almost by act of God, um, Outside of this tent, a oil bubble 
uh, rupture. I don't know what you a geyser it forms. I guess an oil geyser forms and shoots up in the sky, and you get this incredible shot of a bunch of um, Osage members dancing in the oil. Yeah. Then we jump an undisclosed amount of time into the future. Yeah. Um. I. It never. They never say when that opening scene takes place. I'm assuming like late 1800s. Um. You're right. Yeah. But basically, jump to 1920. Right. And there's some voiceover, um, right, that gets us into it, or diegetic, maybe. We get, it's more of like um, title cards and his quote-unquote historical videos that are just, they're filmed but for the movie. But. Right. I thought there was something about the like voiceover. I don't. I couldn't tell if it was De Niro or somebody else. Or maybe it was Lily Gladstone. She has voiceover in a little bit. I think it's going to be very hard for us to remember the exact structure Again, of this stuff. I am stuff. still soaking it yeah. all in, so I'm going to get a lot of things wrong here. Yeah. And this, there's so much to this movie, so I don't think it'll. there's any problem with us kind of doing things a little out of order as long as we get right. the bulk of it right. But we get to the town, essentially. Yeah, we get to the, we establish through like intercut tight um, kind of um, old style. Old like, style like newsreel clips Yeah, is the rough of it that Basically, this town kind of sprouted up, and it's the one place in America where the Native Americans, the Osage, are still like the rule, the quote unquote ruling class. Yeah, and there's even a tarot card that says like per capita, they're amongst one of the richest groups in the world. Yes. Um. Yeah. And after you know, we establish like a lot of the Osage people, you know, in fancy outfits with white servants who yeah. drive them around. Uh, we, you know cut into you know normal widescreen aspect ratio well, yeah it starts with like old style inside of a train and then it yeah. transitions to regular cinematic like color widescreen yeah. style where we get dicaprio we, yeah we train. get introduced to leo who's playing ernest burkhart ernest burkhart a, a simple man also i do want to say for the audience who's picking up on it already that it would be no surprise that i would say towards the second act of the movie we get more Tulsa race uh, massacre. Uh, inf- yes, uh, there's a there's a very clear line drawn between yeah, the two. Exactly. Um, that Scorsese makes no hesitation to put draw that parallel. Yeah. Uh, not quickly, but like I'd say in the mid section of the movie. Yeah. And that th- this is also in Oklahoma, and Tulsa's in Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. Um, around the same time. Why people were mad that minorities were rich, and that's kind of what it was. Yeah, that was the. Um, yeah, that 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 is what this movie putting is. It, putting uh, it in a nutshell. Yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, white people could not handle the fact that anyone but them is sharing in the wealth. Yeah, uh, but we get to meet um, Ernest Burkhart, who returns from World War One. Established, he was fighting in World War One, or he was a chef um, in World War One. Um, he's come back to stay with his uncle uh, William Hale, mm-hmm. called King, played by De Niro. Played by De Niro. Who in real life was forty five years old? Yeah, during these events, De Niro is eighty. Um, but when you look at pictures of the guy, you are like, kind of looks eighty. Well, like, and there are some like uh, they reference some uh, the Osage male victims, and they say like their age, they're twenty five, and then I see their like corpses. I am like, that's a twenty five year old. Yeah. Like what? But then you think you look. I people mean, people aged very poorly. Say look until at, like nineteen seventy. Look at any old photos of people, yeah. and you see like eighteen year olds that look like they're in their thirties. Yeah. like it's just I don't know genes. It's insane medicine. what a mix of medical advancement and the fact that not sixty percent of the population is smoking at all times yeah. will do to skin health. Right. Um, fifty years later. Right. So, uh, yeah, we get we get the first interaction with De Niro and DiCaprio. It's and so fun saying De Niro and DiCaprio. Yeah. Like, they are meant to share the screen they're, together. They're meant to be in every movie together yeah. um, from now on. They really are. But this scene is basically just laying out the the structure of the world for you. Because mm-hmm. De Niro is just like, you want to live here? You like um, this money flows freely here, yeah. he says. And he's describing how, like, he loves the Osage. They're his favorite people. He's, you know, he tremendously respects their culture. But he says they're um, great use of the word tremendously with the Trump hands, by the yes. way. <laughs> he, well, he's basically that's kind of what he's doing. In well, this that's movie. exactly that's kind of where I'm like, yeah, I've, I think De Niro is really extraordinary in this movie. I think um, it's one of his best roles. Yes, I agree, because he's basically playing like a very 
friendly white liberal who's stabbing them in the back the whole time. Yeah. Um, but this whole scene, he's describing how, like, yeah, they're great people, they're tremendous, um, but they're, you know, they're inferior in their ways. Their their culture's dying. Yeah, he um, says it very matter-of-factly. Like, I love them, they're great, they have great culture, they have all this stuff, but they're sickly. Yeah, he that, said sickly is the word he Sickly uses. is the word, because yeah. it carries into uh, Lily Gladstone Molly's line later yeah. when she talks about, oh, why don't you drink... Um, uh there there's like it's not food or it's a drink or it's a smoke or something where yeah. it's like it makes me sickly or whatever yeah and it, it again it's mm-hmm. it's a parallel Daenerys basically saying their culture sickly when the oil dries up they're gonna go back to the savages that they were is his essential inference yeah. because but he's uh, like my cattle ranch is well, gonna live them that was gonna say bill B, uh, bill k hale his fortune comes from cattle ranching yeah um, so he makes that sense of like, you know, I'm a cattle rancher and that'll last forever, but oil's going to dry up sometime. So, uh, sort of kind of justifying his way. Like, you know, they may be rich, but I'm still inferior or, uh, superior to them. Yes. In that way. So the big thing he's talking about is the necessity for getting head rights. Yes. Um, right away. Right yes. away too. Which it, is so funny. Because he just spent the first part of the yeah. whole movie talking about how, you know, I have my business in cattle ranching. Like, their oil wasn't going to drop, but we got to get the head rights. Yeah, we got to get oil. head rights. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I had to look up head rights after the movie just to get exactly what they are. It's basically the Osage allow the government and the mineral companies to mine oil on their land. So long as they get a cut. In exchange for a cut of the profit. Yeah. Um, and so every member of the Osage community is guaranteed a head right. Yeah, uh, they get a percentage, which in the movie, I was a little bit confused about this and I did not look up historically how it was handled. But it's almost like the Osage tribe has like they get they get like allowances per week or per yes. month. Yes, They get paid weekly um, through these head rights. Yeah. But they need a white guardian. Yeah. Um, such as someone, a benefactor who like co-signs for who them. co-signs for them. Yeah. And, um, and, we, and we, that's and Lily Gladstone's first scene. Yes, and Hale is a big. Um, he has a lot of. He guardians a lot of people in the town. Yes. Um. And so we get established to him, and he offers to give Leo a job as a sure. uh, as a cab driver, yeah. essentially. That's when we first get introduced to Molly, mm-hmm. um, who is picking up her allowance. We get a little voiceover from her describe, and she describes several deaths that have already occurred. Yeah. Um, it's basically, like, um, I don't remember these names, but it's like um, Anna, age 23, um, dead, no investigation. Yeah. And she'll stuff about 10 murders that have already occurred. This other occurred. person, dead at 28, no investigation. This person, suicide, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And she goes through like no investigation has been launched at all for any of these. They're all just kind of like all these deaths have been brushed away. Yeah. I mean, at this point, you're just you're led to assume that racism is the only reason, right? Um, and not that it isn't, but later the movie will go into much greater detail about why there's been no investigation for these people. Yeah, and I love that we start with her at her guardian's like sort of office trying yes. to get the allowance that she needs. Yes, because it's very slimy. Did you pick up who that guy is? So I recognize him from somewhere, but like. He is the dude who, in No Country for Old Men, Anton Sugar goes up in to his the a, gas station. Lost in the corn yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I was like, I know that guy from somewhere. He just his mouth is always open. He's like, he's like, well, we we gotta take good care of that, you know. We gotta, go, we, gotta we gotta. I'm make, married into it. <laughs> you married into it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know your mother. Your mother. You know she bought three hundred dollars of meat. Does she need all that meat? Yeah. Like, just the way he's kind of talking, but it, it's very like slimy and gross of like, you know, it's her money. He's she trying should just to be able to get it. He's trying to nickel and dime her of her own money. Yeah. Um, allowance. Right. And eventually she does, she gets her money and she goes outside and she needs a cab back to her house. And it's something worth noting. Sorry. I'm, yes. this is what happens when I just watch it is I'm going to mention every little penny of detail yes. in this movie because something I liked is like, there's people advertising for take photos. Yes. And you realize, and like, listen, I'm not stupid. I know like what inflation has done and shit like that. And I know like, you know, back when people would make jokes that a hundred dollars was a lot of money, but a hundred dollars was a lot of money back then. 
and you can defer that just as an educated audience. Yes. Like you no, you don't need to be told that a forty dollar family picture is a lot of money for a family yeah. picture. So when they do that in the very beginning of the movie, when she walks out and yeah. you see them going up to get their allowance, and meanwhile there's these like carnival barkers essentially yeah. being like, forty get family portraits, family portraits, uh, save your heritage and culture for yeah. forty dollars," and you're like, "What?" And the movie will progressively continue to plant those yeah. moments of like that. And DiCaprio just says it outright at one point. It's like, you're charging me Osage prices. Yeah. And I'm not Osage. Yeah. And it's like, oh. But also, yeah. the the movie is at that point, it's very smart what it's doing. Yes. Because the end of, it all ties into the end of the movie in that, like you, you had just said the line, which is, save your culture through a picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which we'll talk about again at the end of the movie. Yes, we will. Um, uh, which is also beneficial because if you look, you can actually find a lot of the pictures. It does do like a little montage of pictures. Yeah, you can find a lot of those online with the real people instead of the actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does to show how much work they put into matching these styles matching and costumes of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the casting is incredible. Oh um, yeah, they all look great. Mm-hmm. Um, but Leo picks up uh, Molly. Mm-hmm. Um, so agrees to take her home, but not before he gets really interested in some drag car drive, uh, racers through the center of town. Yeah. The dynamic at this point that's being set up is like the Osage are the rich people in town. Mm -hmm. And then the white people are kind of just coming in. There's a few of them and they're just kind of like driving drag cars around and having a good time. They're, they're like a rowdy working class ish. What's interesting was went before she gets into his car um, this other couple walks up and I want to say, is it, is it his cousin Byron or is it that? No, it's the, um, is it that one guy who Bill Smith. Yes. Bill Smith. Okay. Pause. I have a friend in college. Who is that actor's name? who plays Bill Smith. Jason Isbell. Jason Isbell. Yes. I had a friend in college who looks like his twin. Like I shit you not. He looks like his fucking twin. And we're going to continue talking about the movie. But as we do, I'm going to pull up a photo and put them side by side and show it to you because it is uncanny. But yes, that I would guy, like to see it. that guy and his wife, who is Molly's sister. Yes. Rita. 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 Um, and so I, I don't remember much of the dialogue, but it just kind of makes yeah. that plant of like, oh, there's an Osage woman married to a white man. Yes. Plants that seed a little bit. And Molly's obviously very close with her sister and she seems a little wary of bill but she thinks he's fine um yeah for the most part and then the the movie kind of slows down not that it had been fast to this point but it basically spends the next 20 minutes solely on establishing the Ernest and molly relationship Mm -hmm. which is essential for the rest of the movie to work that you believe that relationship this is my friend from college um oh my god he does look he does look just like him that is unsettling i don't like that at all i freaked out a little like is that alex like what um I haven't spoke to him in like four years, so. <laughs> I'll reach out to him and ask him if he was in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, please continue with your thought. But we spend the next 20 minutes kind of just developing the Molly Ernest relationship. Yeah. Um, which is very tenderly done. Molly is resistant at first. And then, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Ernest um, just to her seems like a lovable goof. Yeah. Charming. Yeah. He's charming. He's silly. Um, he makes her laugh. And what, what Scorsese does very well in this movie is there's no disillusion that the Osage women don't know they're being courted for their money. Yes. They make that very clear at the very beginning. She knows exactly what's happening here. Yeah. But she likes him. Yeah. Um, and that's um, not to be reductive of it, but that is to, in some respect, what they're kind of seeing as the best scenario mm-hmm. is like we're going, we're con- we're being exploited and courted for the, our money. The best we can hope for is to kind of make get out with it mm-hmm. um and so she's going along with that and she was very much falling in love with Ernest, and likewise he's falling in love with her and at this point watching the movie from purely like an outside perspective if you because at this point you kind of know already what's going on I feel like even though the movie hasn't said it, you kind of get the vibe De Niro is the killer and that Ernest is somehow involved oh, in it. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, we don't spend very much time. I mean, and Scorsese even says it in, yeah. a, in a comment when it goes to a film festival. It says it's not a whodunit. It's a who didn't do yes. it. 
because that was another thing they said why they changed the plot. Because when if you if the movie was Tom White, you just follow him, he comes to the town. It's very obvious who did it right away. Yeah. You're like, yeah, this guy is the the one who has all the head rights. <laughs> the one who has all the head rights. He clearly he's the guy who did it. And he hires people who are three degrees separated from him. Yes. Like of the same people. Yes. A- and again, it's another thing that's done very well. It's like they're not very smart about how they do certain things. Yeah. Especially early. The second the FBI shows up, it's very easily solved. Yeah. Um, Which is probably how it went down in real life. In in real life, it was like slightly longer of an investigation, but it was basically was like they talked to a few people who gave them enough info that they could had they had they basically knew as opposed to a two and a half hour true crime thriller where they yes. don't find out the killer until the last thirty minutes is not accurately reflective of what actually happened. Yes, and so you know coming into the movie and you're. As an audience member, you've probably already kind of figured out who's done the killings. Yeah. Um, and so this whole romance, you're like, is she stupid? Is she not seeing what I'm seeing? And you have to like take a step back and be like, of course, no, she isn't. Why would they? Like, we know as a viewer of this movie, coming at it usually in our perspective, especially as white people, we can kind of figure out like, Okay, I see what this movie's trying to say here, but the characters within the movie aren't living in that reality. Oh, okay. Uh, like, so, Mo- like Molly do- has no idea who's doing the killing. She doesn't know she's in a murder mystery or a crime crime thriller. Yeah, I guess you could almost say that about every movie. But, yeah, but I get from what I was understanding was like he is doing his best to seem as much of an ally as possible yes. to the Osage people. Yes. To such a degree where it's like, like I love that scene when they're convening in the mm. tent for the first time after like the yeah twenty fifth murder, and they're finally they're all like convening and they're all getting passionate, and mm. then at the very end of the me- of the meeting, De Niro stands up like, and I will put an extra thousand dollars in the investigation, and I'll make sure we get like so and so to investigate this case, and it's like, but again, we know yeah, like we we're, we're coming at it a hundred years of history beyond. Yeah. To the characters, they don't know how deeply they're being deceived. Yeah. And that's what I find so interesting about the romantic subplot of this movie is that's a deeply evil proposition. Mm-hmm. Like what Leah, what Ernest is doing is from the beginning of this movie, as a viewer, I'm finding it unsettling and somewhat evil. Yeah. Because even if his love is genuine, I see like why he's coming into it and I see that he's complicit in these murders somehow. Which is why it confused me a lot. Yeah. Not for not in a bad way to complain about it, but just in a way that it really made me have to think of yeah. like, okay, like I don't think he's smart enough to like pull off this con mm-hmm. without genuine love. Genuine love. Which I truly believe that he has. Yeah. And I think that's the the great moment at the end of the movie. Oh is my like, god! His, like his the love, fucking last his scene. love is real, and he doesn't understand why she's not reciprocating at that point. Right? He's I, confused. I just oh, that last scene um, is so good. But um, so like this, the romance is evil, but it's genuine, and yeah. that's what's crazy about it. Can, I, this uh, this is going to be so like rap- rapidly rushed, but I do just kind of want to put it into one sentence to exemplify what we mean by it yeah like he is courting her so he can marry her so in the background they can kill all of her siblings while slowly poisoning her so by the time she's the only one left she dies and they get the head rights yes is that not the most mustache frenchman evil villain scheme you've ever heard of it's it's diabolically evil right um and leo is just is convinced because he actually does like her that like yeah they're fine and she won't get hurt by this yeah well it's my thing is like again he leo is playing a stupid man yes he's playing an idiot in this movie he's playing an idiot explicitly yeah he is just going along with what he's being told yeah scorsese at this point in his career has now done two movies about guys who this and the irishman are both movies about people who just go along with doing what they're told Mm -hmm. um and then end up damned at the end of their life Mm -hmm. yeah um and so i find it interesting he's basically kind of continuing that thread from the Irishman with this character. Yeah. But in an even more reductive way, like that Leo is fully and utterly an idiot who turns a blind eye to everything. He does. It's almost, he does the same thing in silence in a way too. Mm -hmm. 
that these two priests that are kind of like postulatizing to yeah. all these people, which in that inherent way is kind of wrong to do, mm -hmm. but they're also being punished for it. But then at the same time, Andrew Garfield then rejects it. Like I mentioned silence because I, it is my personal favorite Scorsese movie. Yes. I don't think it's his best, but it's my favorite. Yeah. Like talking about Killers Fly Moon now, I want to go back home and watch Silence again. Right. I, now. I think there's basically no wrong answer to the question. What's your favorite sure, Scorsese? Sure. Absolutely. Unless you're like the what's the Tibetan one? I heard the Tibetan one's not good. I, people like Kundun. It's Kundun. Oh, is that what? But it some is? people like Kundun. I've, um, I've just heard other people say like everything but that movie. The one I always, I mean, I've seen Hugo. Um, Hugh, that is a Scorsese. I, and I, I like, forget. I like Hugo. I'm not. This is not me besmirching the good name of Hugo. Um, but I do think that's maybe the one that's like he made. He explicitly made it for his daughter because yeah. he wanted to make a movie his daughter could watch because his daughter could not watch any of his other movies that's, for obvious reasons. That's so true. Um, Hugo's just maybe like the least exciting one to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, but who knows? Maybe we'll do the Ass of Butterfield podcast one day and we'll talk about Hugo. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I will, spoiler alert, let the audience know we will be covering another Scorsese in the near future. Um, you can wrap your head around what that's going to be. Um, so, uh, yeah, we. I think you did a great job of kind of like, I'm, all, I'm not saying blowing yeah. through in a negative way, but like kind of go. You. This is a you, three and a half hour movie. We're going to have to blow through well, something. Well, you, you've <laughs> done a really nice job of summing up like 20 minutes of the movie, which as you put it perfectly, it's just like the evolution and growth of their yeah. ro romance together. Yeah. And they get married. And they get married. Um, yeah. They get married. It's a very lovely little romance. And But this is where we're first kind of established to a sickness that's going through her family. Yeah, because it, it like, how many people have diabetes in her family? Um, multiple people have diabetes. And then her sister is very ill. Her sister, Rita. I... I, I, this I have to be very very careful on this topic because it's probably built up by a lot of historical fallacies mm -hmm. involved. But I think I actually did read something that like there there was like very there was a high prevalence of diabetes in Native mm -hmm. American uh, peoples. Yes, I that, that I believe that's accurate. Okay, I don't um, know how or why or what co what conveyed into that. It was a a big thing that there was a high level of diabetes and. Insulin, which was a relatively new invention at the time, was in a usual sense not making its way to um, the people who actually needed it. it because was, when insulin first came out, wasn't it like really gouged, like in a high price, or was it actually cheap? Um, it was. It was a high price. Yeah. Um, in this movie, like the only reason she gets insulin is because De Niro pays for it. Yeah. And makes a big show of paying for it. But that is another great yeah. thing about this movie is that any good thing De Niro does for Molly entirely exploited is it just he just needs game. her to stay because he says it a lot on multiple occasions like when he's doing good things for people people are like why are you like helping this person out it's like oh he's my good friend i yeah. love him he's great and he owes me twenty five thousand dollars, and my insurance policy lapses yeah. in like a few weeks or whatever so he needs yeah. to make it a few more months you're yeah. like oh okay he's literally playing socks with people's lives God, he's so um, fucking good in this he movie. is so good in this movie oh <laughs> but it's it's um, in the same way that Jordan Belfort in The Wolf of Wall Street is, you know, playing with literal stocks yeah. um, that are damaging companies and their employees, De Niro's whole thing in this movie is he's playing the stock market with human people, lives. With people. Yes. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I put an investment into Henry. I need Henry to survive until January, and then he can die because I can get the payment. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so uh, Ernest and Molly get married in the the forefront of all this because this is all happening in the background. We're established yeah. that Rita's sick, and uh, that also that their mother Liz is is old. She's mm -hmm. getting near the end of her life, just naturally. Because we we haven't really talked about Byron, which is De Niro's son, DiCaprio's cousin. Yes, I think they're brothers. I think they? Byron and Ernest are brothers. So they're both De Niro's nephews. Then. Yes, they're both De Niro's okay. nephews. Okay, I thought they were. This different. is one of those great movies where um, the family dynamic is immediately fucked up. <laughs> and you're just like, okay, why is only the nephews living with the, with the uncle? It is kind of weird. Um, because Byron's married to one of Molly's sisters, too. Yes. 
because it's Byron, there's Bill, well, and there's Ernest. Ernest is married to Molly. Byron is married to... I don't think they're married. I think Byron's just with Anna. Well... Because I don't think they ever established that they're married. Oh, you know, no, you are absolutely correct. It is Bill married to... Rita. Re- Minnie. Oh, he's married to Minnie first. You're Minnie, right. Minnie, and Minnie. then he marries yes. Rita afterwards. Yes. Anna is the only one that goes the entire movie without marrying one of the yes. brothers. Yes, men. Men. Yeah. Um, and so just to kind of relay that out for the audience, I'm sorry. Um, Molly's three sisters are Minnie, Rita, and Anna. Minnie is married to Bill Smith, who we'd mentioned earlier in the movie. Rita and Anna are both unmarried, but Anna is seeing Ernest's brother, Byron. And her mom is Lizzie. Yes, her mom is Lizzie. Mm-hmm. And so we basically spend, we jump a few years, um, just kind of sequentially, Leo and yep. um, Molly have a few kids. Um, and we're just kind of spend some time kind of soaking in their family dynamic. Mm-hmm. We get a part where... Um, I can't remember whose parents they are, but some white parents come to visit and they're they're like one kid looks white. Yeah, one, one kid, kid looks kid whiter looks, than the other. Looks whiter than the other, but they're both half breeds. Yes. Yeah. Um and we just are slowly slowly kind of watching the world get whiter and whiter. Yes. More and more white people are coming into the town. Um they're described as vultures at one point by the chief of the of the Osage tribe. Um, but as more and more white people are coming into the town, the kind of the world is just becoming whiter. Um, and we're getting more moments of just open face racism like this. And there's a there's a great scene in one of the funerals. I think it was Lizzie's. Uh, Molly's mom, when she's at the funeral and she's like crying and mourning, but she looks up and there's like a. A, a, a continuous shot that's like close-ups that's panning across the crowd of people watching her. Yes. And you see the out, the unbalanced side of how many white people are at the funeral versus Osage. Yes. Tribal people at the funeral. Yes. And I thought that was so good. We get several moments where we cut to Molly's POV yeah. uh, like that and we just kind of see more and more white people fill in the world. Yeah. Uh, but kind of through this, we go through this time lapse and then we basically sequentially get two of Molly's sisters dying. Yeah, the first one being Minnie. Yeah, Minnie dies of her illness. Of her illness. And, you know, we get that funeral and we get we see the family mourn. And then there's a, I think it's very shortly after that we see Bill, who was married to Minnie, with Rita. And there's a quick call out about it, or call upon it, where, you know, DiCaprio sees Bill to Rita and it's like, is that Rita? Mm-hmm. You know, the other sister. Yeah. And this is Ernest, kind of on his Ernest side. Yeah. He's not asking the question in the way of like, oh, I see you playing the game, smart mm-hmm. guy. No, he's asking the question of like, are you just, did you just bounce to another sister? Where he's genuinely yeah. like kind of surprised and shocked about it. Again, that's another, it leads to both Scorsese and DiCaprio, where DiCaprio does a nice job of like, yeah. he's so dumb that he's not like, He's not the mustache twirly yeah. villain. Like he's fully aware of the scheme that he is involved in. Right. Um, and that he is in this relationship because of the money. But at the end of the day, he's like, Yeah, me and Molly are married. She is my wife, and we have a very nice relationship and two kids. Another scene that exemplifies that very perfectly is when he announces she's pregnant with her third child. Yes. Cause you can see, and this is so good on De Niro and yeah. DiCaprio's part, because De Niro's reaction to that is like he tries to kind of force a smile. Yeah. But he's also kind of looking at because he's a control freak about yeah. it too. He because I as the audience, I bet you and I read his mind yeah. saying the same line, which was, "Why didn't you like consult with me before yeah. doing that?" Be- and we know that because he just got done berating him for consulting him on like a buying a pig farm or something. Yes. And so I see like De Niro's just talking with his eyes mm-hmm. to DiCaprio at the reveal that she's pregnant with her third child. And it it just goes to perfectly show when he confronts DiCaprio about it, and he's like, "Well, Molly and I are married. Like, yeah. we we love each other. We do some love, and that's just what's natural." He doesn't fully understand. He knows that he's involved in the scheme, and he just weirdly has this vision of like him and Molly are like 
kind of outside of it. They're gonna yeah, they're outside. I was just gonna get the money at the end. It's fine. Yeah. The th- I want to sidebar about De Niro real quick. Yeah. And the thing I really like about him in this movie is that for the past like fifteen years, De Niro's career has been he's either really good in a Scorsese movie or he's playing like bad grandpa. He's done like seven <laughs> movies where he plays bad, yeah. gra- where he plays grandpa. He's bad grandpa and Joker. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, but like he's always playing like gra- kindly grandpas in these movies now. And the thing that I love is he does that in this movie. Is he's playing, a, he's doing like all of his like, oh shucks, gee whiz, like kindly grandpaisms. In the service of being Satan. While Satan's. holding a dagger behind yeah, his back. In the service of disguising that he is Satan incarnate. Yeah, quite literally. Um, and I just think that's just an incredible manipulation of his iconography at this point in his career. Yeah. Um, to take his kindly grandpa-ness and turn it around into making him the villain. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, a thought is in my head and I'm deciding whether I should write it down and wait to talk about it at the end or if we should talk about it now. It's an overarching point of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just talk about it now. Okay. You want to talk about the end? No, no, no. It's an overarching oh, thing about this sure. movie that we alluded to at the very beginning sure. that I think maybe now is a good time to yeah, bring it up. discuss it. <sighs> the The idea of, as we've been talking about this movie so far, which maybe we've made it through like 30% of the plot mm-hmm. maybe, how much we're Ugu and Ogging over the performances of DiCaprio and De Niro because they have so much meat of this movie. Mm -hmm. And the conflict I feel inside of how much of that is lost in the Osage tribal POV Mm -hmm. of how much Scorsese quote unquote should have dedicated to versus how much he smartly planned Mm -hmm. it to, you know, I want to be like Scorsese is such a genius. He put just as much Osage POV yeah. into this movie that was required and needed. But there's a small side of me. It's like, did we lose a little bit of that? That could have been like, again, I, I think the, the theme and purpose of the story that we yeah. just said at the very beginning is as earnest and honest as Scorsese, De Niro and DiCaprio yeah. set out to do. But I wonder if that element, meaning yeah. the, in my somewhat interpretation of the lack of the Osage POV takes a small thing away from that. So I want to talk about one part of that and then I want to push the rest of it to the end. Cause I think the very last scene is so specifically about that exact idea. Um, I want to talk about Molly in that respect right now. I'm literally going to write it in my note. Cause I had the same thing I'm yeah. like worried about. I do think the very end of the movie is the, right place to bring this up because it, I think this movie has a coda at the end of it that directly criticizes itself. And it's it was a pleasantly frustrating part I had in this movie that every time I th- was feeling I was lacking something, the next scene Scorsese delivered it. Yes, he delivered it or he would directly criticize the movie for not doing that, um, which is the last scene. Um, but Molly, it's, you know, we only really get her POV in like small segments in between the, the DiCaprio stuff. Yeah. Um, but when it does come to her or even in the background of the DiCaprio, you know, stuff, she is always a powerful presence Mm -hmm. and she's such the heart of this movie and like the heart of the Osage that there are these people who are just kind of forced into, even though they have the money and they have, the seeming power they're entirely subservient to like white masters in this area yeah they're subservient to people who own their head rights and subservient to their husbands yeah and the whole time they're just trying to eke out a living and continue their family and their culture all the while these white people are running around with insane schemes and plottings and all this and they're just trying to live yeah and they're just trying to live because lest we not forget that uh, Lily Gladstone, Molly, is sickly bedridden for almost half this movie. Yes, basically. From I like, say that as a compliment, mm-hmm. and that, she still maintains an incredible presence in that. Yes, the owl. Yes, oh, the owl's great. The owl's so good. Tremendous owl. Yeah. Um. Um. Back. Back to the plot. We were with Minnie had just been killed, or had died. Had quote died unquote. of of an illness. 
Um, her other sister, Anna, who is established to have, like, not a drinking problem, but she drinks a lot. Um, I would almost say... You'd say like, drinking problem? I would say, like, Scorsese is pretty openly saying, like, no, she has a drinking problem. That's because fair. that's a reality. Yes, that's fair. That's such a historical reality for... Especially uh, for this time. Tr- tribal natives, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, because she's someone who is very um, open about feeling like their people are oppressed. Mm-hmm. Um and so she shows up to an event at the house drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, and Molly kind of it starts a fight um, in which Ernest has to hold his brother, Byron, back. And Molly has to hold Anna back. Because Byron and Anna aren't married. But they're seeing each but other. But they're seeing each other. Yeah. Um, and Molly and Byron accuses Molly, or, uh, sorry, Anna of seeing another guy. And it starts a fight. They break it up. Um, Anna sleeps it off. And then Molly comes to the room and is like, Byron's ready to take you home. Um, who she had just fought with. Uh, Ernest tells Anna. Ernest tells Byron. Her. Okay. Yeah. And at that point, I fi- I figured you probably immediately at this point know where the scene's going. Absolutely. She's going to get killed on the way. Absolutely. Yeah. And no no disillusion of that whatsoever. Yes. And so that that is what happens the next day. Molly gets told yeah. Anna's dead. It's we need sad. you to identify the body. It's sad because we're waiting for it. Yeah. We literally the moment Ernest walks in and he like takes off his hat and she's sleeping with her mom and it's like, but all right, Byron's ready to take you home. Let's go. And but that's what's so insidious about this movie, and mm-hmm. I say it as like a compliment for the the craft of it, is that we know what's about to happen. Absolutely. And the entire time, Molly has no idea who killed her sister. And Ernest, she buys but, basically what Byron says. And Ernest either because he's dumb or because he's ignorant or blind to it still plays the role of the loving husband. Yeah. Because the very end when the testimony scene, when she's visualizing it happening, what does that scene end with? It ends with like her giving Byron a pillow. Yeah. And going back and cuddling with her husband in bed. Yeah. (sighs) Like, (sighs) ah, (laughs) <laughs> we coming at this this story a hundred years later find it very obvious what's happening. Yeah. But at the time, to people like Molly, like they're not like they have no reason to suspect that their husbands and their brother in laws, uncle in laws, are stabbing and killing are, and are the ones who are murdering them. Their own family behind their back. Yes. Yeah. Um. But after many, after you know, two of her sisters have died, they all attend a um like tribal meeting. Mm-hmm. To determine, to basically make a plan for what's what's going to happen next, because Anna's death was like, for the most part, unconspicuously a murder. Yes. Whereas Rita, or no, Minnie, did die like from her of illness, quote unquote illness. Well, and I think even Scorsese says like, oh no, she did die of an illness. Yeah. I don't think he's making any allusion to like Minnie possibly being like. Well, I believe she's, actually, she's definitely actually, being poisoned. You know what? You're right because of the whole insulin thing. She's definitely being poisoned because um, she looks exactly the same as what Molly turns yes. into. And I remember from the book. I haven't. Uh, it's been a year since I've read the book, but it, it mostly was poisons like this. They they would just like slip it into people's food and medication, mm-hmm. um, yeah. to incapacitate and then slowly kill. Yeah. Um. Evil. So, yes. <laughs> Pure evil. Yeah. Um, the there's a tribal meeting, and they determine that they are gonna put money together to hire a private investigator. Um, to or no, they're gonna send a guy to Washington D.C. to talk with the federal government, and they're also gonna hire a private investigator. Yes. Molly decides to hire the private investigator, and they agree to send this guy whose name we know for two scenes, and then he. Dies. Yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> let me see if I can figure out this guy's name. Because I don't remember seeing him earlier in the movie. Maybe a throw throwaway scene. But yeah, like, I don't remember how he fits into this, but he's like just some. He's like a white ally. Some jamoke in the meeting. Yeah, they're yeah. like, yeah, he will go to DC. Um, he does not make it to DC. He is. Well, he st- makes it to DC. No, isn't he stabbed before he gets on the train, or Be- is it when he gets off the train? No, he no he he is in a building and he gets a telegraph, and then the telegraph says, "Be careful." He steps outside, mm-hmm. starts walking away, gets stabbed, and then the background you can see the U.S. Capitol. Okay, okay, I I mix up my timeline, and it's even worse because 
He gets stabbed. Police discover his body, but then just leave his body there. Yeah. Because that's how deep the corruption goes. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that it's it's a small criticism that I, as a viewer, was not totally aware the level of influence De Niro had outside of that town. Mm-hmm. I think in regards to the the Washington part, those are probably just two guys who he had hide out in the train. Mm. Um, because mm. it, the end of the okay. movie does really kind of lean, he has no influence in D.C., um, because the second DC gets involved, everything falls apart for him. That's true. So, okay. Well, then I guess it might then critique would just be like, yeah. I just didn't know that. Yeah. That, like I thought he like hired, like sent a telegraph to cops in DC, be like, Hey, there's a guy who's going to get off his train. This time o'clock. Mm-hmm. Make sure he doesn't make it to the Indian uh, affairs committee yes. or whatever. Um, yeah, it's a little, it's a little loosey goosey with that, but yeah. I think that's kind of just, um, but don't you agree? That's one line of dialogue of yes. like, uh, what do you mean we have to charge Bill Hale? He owns like every cop west of the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, just a line that gives us like it builds the walls of how mm-hmm. much he owns. Yeah, because right now there's no walls. Yeah, I do think the walls are just the town at the end of the day. Right, we mm-hmm. can defer that. Yeah, I just don't think that was like explicitly clear. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a very small complaint. Yeah, like that's it, a, such a small complaint. If, if that's the if that's the most the best complaint we can muster at this point in the movie, this movie's doing great. <laughs> it may not be the best compl- like the best complaint I have, but yet I'm still thinking of yeah. more. But like I still would even say like any other complaint I might think of after that mm-hmm. is going to be at that level of how small it is. Yes. Um. So you were just saying like yeah they had that tribal meeting and they talk about like the white vultures. It's so funny in that meeting where they talk about like the white vultures infiltrating the town. Yeah. And then De Niro says something like oh thank you Bill Haley you're such a great person of like yeah. it, it's like, you're a great ally to us. Tell me how you felt, but me as the audience I'm like screaming in my head. It's like that's the guy you want to get. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like that is not your ally. Like you are you are on the right track. You're so close to be like. Like these white vultures, like yeah. yes, it is the white vultures, including the ones in your tent with yeah. you. Like, that's how snake like they are. Is that's what's that that is what's so insidious about this movie is that it's putting you in the POV of the villains. Yeah, it's like um, Scorsese's run where it's like Goodfellas is a movie where you're put into the perspective of this. All, all my life, I wanted to be a mobster. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to be like, yeah, this is great. This is a the theme of the movie. Quite literally, they use the song "Rags to Riches," and you're like, this guy's great. And then the end of the movie reinterprets the whole thing as you've just kind of been rooting for this guy to become a murderer. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Taxi Driver. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Casino. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Same thing with The Irishman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing with this, except this is Scorsese taking that idea to its most like depraved bear form. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where it's just like, yeah, I'm going to put you in the mindset of this um, this veteran, this American veteran who's coming back from the war, and he's going to make, he's going to, you know, get a white picket fence and build himself an American life, and it's only going to come at the expense of, of uh, 30 to 60 Indian lives. It's, I'm just, I'm putting what you said in quotes, and we're going to put it on a plaque, yeah. but it's, it's Scorsese putting that motif into its barest, most evil yes. form. That yes. is Killers of the Flower Moon. Yes. It's doing what he's done in all past movies, but putting the most barest evil form. Yes. And forcing you as an audience member to sit there for three and a half hours in that mindset. And hopefully feel terrible about it. He, he wants you to feel upset and unpleasant watching this movie. Um, he wants you to be in the perspective of these characters and the whole time it's been like, I cannot believe this fucking happened. Like, what is going on? How could DiCaprio go be going along with this? How could Nanir be going along with this? And at the end of the day, they just want money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And by putting you in that perspective, you know, hopefully you, people walk out of the theater kind of feeling a little icky about the whole affair. Yeah. When, peop- when movies make people uncomfortable, uh, some people kind of see that as a bad thing. And there are obviously situations where that is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to cases specifically, I think of a lot of Scorsese movies, like Taxi Driver is a movie that make you're supposed to feel very upset and icky coming out of that movie. You're not supposed to come up, Travis Bickle really had a good idea, didn't he? You're supposed to be like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> like, is this what we're doing here? Is this our country? Is this all this country is? 
I just it's just built on murder and we're just all living along all equally complicit in it in some way or another. Is that really it? And Scott's like, yeah, you you kinda getting what I'm going at here. Not um, all movies supposed to make you feel icky or a bad thing. Kinda like the whale. Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna go back. We're not talking about the whale. <laughs> we will talk about the whale at one point in this episode, and I think you know exactly what it's gonna be. <laughs> oh, wait, why? <laughs> no, this is this is just based on a very funny tweet that I saw. Oh, um, okay. Got it. But so the next we can kind of jump through like the next like another 20 minute interlude. I think we can honestly kind of jump through the next hour pretty quick. Yeah. Um, because it, it's obviously an hour. A lot happens in an hour of a movie. Yeah. Um, but the basic core of it is De Niro reveals his whole plan to DiCaprio. Yes. DiCaprio, who had been aware of the basics of it. Yeah. But was not aware of the, you know layers of it he brings him into his masonic lodge uh the nears a freemason yeah um and he s- literally spanks him because what de niro was tasked to do was to hire a guy to kill bill and read it's okay just like yeah. give it some slack okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're a little kid like meh, no. meh. Uh, but dicaprio was supposed to hire blackie who's like kind of like the town criminal yes to kill Bill and Rita, reading being being Bill's new wife, one of Molly's other sisters after the death of Minnie. Yeah. Bill and Rita. Supposed to die, right? Mm-hmm. But what does DiCaprio do? He pitches this whole plan to him. But then as he's pitching to to him, this is one of like this movie is scattered with some like comedic yeah. scenes. Yes. And this is one of them where as he's talking to Blackie, he's like yeah, you can have like whatever money's on them. I'm sure he always carries two hundred dollars. Oh in yes, his he offers his car. It's like oh, and there's also jewels you can get on Rita. Like, and he keeps like upping it because yeah. Blackie's like, you're such a like a greedy Jew or whatever. Yeah. Like he keeps saying that, and so he's like, well, you, you know, there's like two hundred dollars on his pocket, or Rita has some jewels. You, you know, what? take my car. Well, yeah. I have insurance on it anyway. Like he keeps yeah. like adding more things, and but then he what, gets busted stealing his car. Well, like, because what he does is he's added a scheme into a scheme. Yes. <laughs> the original scheme was, I need you to uh, take a hit on these two guys, but in order to do that for you, so you to get paid, and you do a fake steal my car so I can claim insurance on it, and he gets caught stealing the car. Yes. <laughs> so that's what brought makes De Niro bring DiCaprio into the Masonic t- Temple yeah. because he paddle boards his ass. He spanks him. He spanks him. He spanks him. him like a little boy. <laughs> yes. And then he's like, why did you do that? You idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the three moments in this movie that let De Niro be really funny are admittedly really funny. Yes. It's like this in the one part where he's like, look at me like you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yes. After the FBI showed up. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that so he good. tells um, Ernest, hey, so Molly's kind of prying around. We've, we've got her insulin. Um, it'll help deal with her diabetes but you're gonna put a little something in it yeah um and we're gonna you know just knock her out slow her down a bit slow her down a bit Ugh. <laughs> yeah just slow doesn't down. that line just make you like quiver yes. and ickiness you're just like Ugh. like it's also the way he delivers yeah it. and Ernest is like it'll only slow her down that he's like yes he's like oh that's fine but he's poisoning her yes he's poisoning his wife yeah um before you know Molly becomes too bedridden her mother does pass away not before seeing a vision of an owl. Yes, she sees a vision of an owl, and then at, on her actual deathbed, she sees. Um, uh, it's like, uh, like I presume it's um, the Osage God, um, whose name they say a few times, and I have forgotten what it is. Um, and then there's an older couple that I interpreted as her parents. Or per- perhaps it is her parents. I interpret it as like their god and goddess. Uh, um, well, there's three. There's yes. one in full like mm-hmm. o- Osage m- yeah. native garments and makeup, and then there's two o- older mm-hmm. people. I interpreted it as like I thought that was like a spiritual leader, okay. guardian, maybe God. Yeah. And then the two older folks I thought were like interpreted that would make as parents. There's no wrong interpretation of that thing yeah. though. I'm sure um, in the actual Osage customs, there's a, you know very explicitly what they believe yeah. um, your past is the afterlife looks like. I just unfortunately do not have that information um, yeah. in front of me right now. Yeah, um, but she does see um, ancestors of some sort welcoming her to the afterlife. Is it on the movie's part to make us understand that? I don't think so. 
for a deal like that. I think that by just by seeing it, like we should understand the significance of it to this culture. It was just a thought that as you were talking about it, it's like the the airplane idea came and then it just boop. And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I'm i not sure about that as if, it, if I'm going as far as to say that's a complaint. But like you just said it of like, you know, I unfortunately don't know about that information as much as I kind of should. I'm like, again, does it lead to the hint of suspicion that I feel like we were missing a little bit of the Osage POV. Well, I feel like if if you are an Osage person watching this movie, you know, that scene is very clear to you. Yeah. In the same way that all that it's so clear to us that De Niro is the killer. Mm. Like, I don't think it's on the movie to make us understand the Osage culture. Just like um, it's not on the movie to have people from the Osage culture understand that yeah. De Niro is a killer. And like, I don't, and I think that just by, you know, being white people watching this movie, um, by seeing that scene, that is telling us so much more about the Osage culture than I'm sure either of us knew going into this movie. Sure. Going into this movie, all I knew about the Osage culture is what I read in the Killers of the Flower Moon book. Yeah. Um, I don't have any connection to their culture. And this movie's kind of, you know, it's like what they say at the beginning, preserve your history in a picture. Yeah. Um, this is in some small way a preservation of history. Yeah. Um, but Lizzie then passes on. Let me. Lizzie passes on. Molly starts really failing. Um, mm-hmm. It starts getting sicker and sicker. Because her only living sister left is Rita, who's married to Bill. Yes. Um, but not for long. Damn, why did you uh, just say it like that? <laughs> um, because De Niro orders a hit on their house. We're about to talk about what I believe is a very sad scene that I watched it. I'm like, Jeff's going to make this a bit. (laughs) There's no bit to this scene. There's no bit to this scene. There's no bit to this scene. This scene is kind of horrific. It is. Um, And, you know, we are going through this plot. Um, We're probably like almost two hours in at this point. There's so much we haven't talked about because it is simply impossible for us to talk about everything in this movie. Yeah. There's so many characters we're skipping over. Just go see this movie. It's well worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's... um, a, a couple quick little pointers I maybe will help fill in some mm. gaps was Molly is suspicious somebody is poisoning her, but she has no idea nor any hint of suspicion that yeah. her husband's behind it because she confides with DiCaprio. There's one scene where the doctors come with the insulin yeah. and she's like, no, did you like that? He's like picking up on the language and there's, ha- yeah, I like that DiCaprio does learn how to speak Osage. And it's another one of those things of like, he's, He's a part and acknowledging this evil plan, and yet, like, because De Niro can speak fluent Osage, just yeah. established a few times in the movie. Yeah, it's uh, just it's very interesting. Like DiCaprio, like you assume that takes a point of care. Yes, because you can say De Niro, De Niro learned it because he wanted to be mm-hmm. able to talk to Osage people yeah. in their own language and exploit it that way. But when DiCaprio learns it, it feels like he just learned it naturally by just spending time with yes molly molly which maybe that's just me reflecting innocence on it and mm-hmm. maybe he's doing it just as nefariously as de niro, de niro would do it but in my opinion when he if he first speaks osage i'm like oh that's kind of cute yeah you know like he no doubt has genuine love for molly and for his children yeah but the doctors walk in and they have the insulin and she's saying to osage like i no, yeah. like tell them to go away he, he didn't dicaprio is playing a character so um stupid that He's basically told, like, by De Niro, hey, just poison your wife, um, and it's all going to be fine. We're going to get a lot of money. A lot of people are going to die, but it's gonna, it's all fine. And DiCaprio's like, okay, if, if you say it's fine, I believe it's fine. Does he know he is, like, poisoning her to death? He be- I think he just believes he's poisoning her to slow down, because that's what he was told. And that's he just he believes told. that. Okay, okay, because I want to hang on to that thread, because this that same scene i'm talking about is one of his best performances yeah because he tells the doctors to go away and then they have like a screaming match where it's like like your culture isn't going to save you like you want to go get herbs and bush and he does like a fake um uh uh yeah um and to molly but it almost to me feels like he's doing it out of love for her because mm-hmm. he does want her to, to get, get the better insulin. like you like you need this western medicine like because yeah. you can if you just look at this from text on paper it'd be like a racist husband yeah right but then you watch the scene and it's like oh no he's pleading with her to like yeah. take this medicine to save her life he's absolutely still racist in the moment but he's like 
he, as far as he's concerned, that's not racist. That's love. Right. Um, and it just continues to go into like the in, kind of insidious nature of what's being put on the screen. Yeah. So she does take it, but it's like only you can administer. Yeah, because she's like, I know you're the one person I can trust not to poison me. Uh, and he's the only person who does want. I mean, the doctors were doing it as well, but. Uh, yeah. And so while she's being poisoned, um, Bill and Rita's house explodes. Um, there was one scene before oh, that I wanted to say. It's yes. the scene when Bill and Ernest have a scene together in the room. Okay. Oh, yes. Because that that's a really good scene. That was one of the two moments the audience I was watching it today with were laughing during. Because there's a scene when Bill and Ernest are sitting in the other room at Bill's house, mm. and they're trying. They're they start having trying to have a conversation. Um, sorry, I gotta make some adjustments here. Um, they start by trying to have a conversation. Yeah. But it quickly devolves into like, I don't really like you much. He's like, Well, I'm. I'm sorry about that, Ernest. It's just how God made me. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can't really do much about that. It's like, but he's like, well, when are you going to have your cousin or brother take care of that? Yeah. And he kind of like hints to like the whole thing of like, we can all, t like, again, what you just said, we as the audience like can defer very quickly that Ernest and Bill are behind the schemes. Yeah. And that is, uh, or William Hale, Hale yes. versus Bill, not, not yeah. De Niro Bill, but what would you say the actor's name was? But um, uh, yeah. Jason Isbell. Jason Isbell. He's telling him what we kind of have already inferred of like, listen, like it doesn't take two and you put two and two yeah. together. It doesn't take much to know that you guys are what's behind killing all these people. Yeah. And that's when De Niro just leave or DiCaprio just leaves. Yeah. Um, And it, and that's basically when they're like, okay, we got to deal with Bill. Yeah. Immediately. Um, And so, Bill and Ray's house does just explode. Um, yeah, they a very shocking scene. Very shocking scene. Bill, uh, DiCaprio, Ernest, and Molly go to bed, and they just put the kids asleep, and they moved in closer to the city. Yeah. Um, did they say why? Well, so what I kind of interpret this whole thing as is that the town becomes whiter and whiter um, as more and more people come in. We get a lot of shots of white people pouring out of trains, and then you start seeing the town less with significantly less Osage people in positions of power. Yeah. Um, you start seeing more and more white people in suits instead of Osage people in suits. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more Osage working the lower echelon jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like kind of the whole town's being homogenized. And when they move into the city, that's when I... Because it looks just like a suburb. It looks like a white they suburb. They are literally white copy and paste homes. Yeah. Um, it's like any, you know, bungalow belt you've been to in the U.S. Literally, yeah. Um, and it's just like the town has fully become white America, homogenized suburb. Yeah. They're not living out in country pastures. Yes. You know. They're not living in tribal land anymore. Which cultural media-wise is how we associate as like more like, I'm going to say this phrase, but like tribal land. Yes. Kinda. We're not in tribal land anymore. We're yeah. in suburb America. Yes, we're in suburban America. Um, uh, the West, quote unquote, is being tamed, is what we're seeing. What was that? Sounds like someone else in the building. I'm like, drop something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and if if you think audience members that like, is this Jeff and Stewart like jacking off a prestigious director and giving him more credit than what he deserves? Like, I can you agree that I typically tend to be the person that likes to call that out? Yeah. I, I usually tend to be the person that calls out, are we giving this filmmaker too much credit than what they deserve? Mm -hmm. And even I'm agreeing with this. Yes. Okay. No, so Scorsese has been doing this for 60 years. He knows, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Um, And so the they're in bed and then the windows explode. The windows explode. Um, Leo gets Molly and the kids into the basement. Mm -hmm. And the whole time Molly's yelling like, whose house was it? Whose house was it? And it's like Tulsa. Yeah. You're also hearing it's like Tulsa because yeah. right before this scene, there's like a TV. There, there's a quick there, glance at a TV of the Tulsa race. They're massacre. in a movie theater. Um, yes, that's what it is. De Niro's watching the newsreel and it's the Tulsa. Um, the Black Wall Street yeah, Massacre. Yeah, Black Wall Street Massacre. Yeah. And you're literally seeing, because he, he has these big Coke bottle glasses in the movie, and you're literally seeing the Tulsa explosions reflected in his glasses. Yeah. Putting them in his eye about what his how he's going to continue this next. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and how just, you know, white people are forcing people of color out of positions of power and resetting yeah. the matrix. Um, resetting the matrix. Not in relation to the movie The Matrix. I know, but, but like it's... The, yeah. I can tell your brain is in very specific locked-in positions. <laughs> yeah, in resetting the matrix of um, uh, power in America. Yeah. But the house... T- yeah, but they're asking, like, whose house was it? Whose house was it? And you hear a distant voice say, it's Bill and Rita's. Yeah. And so the, he goes out, and they find Bill still somewhat alive, screaming under the Shoot rubble. Shoot me. Shoot me. Yeah, he yeah. does die. Um, Rita, they find her body. Oh, yeah. Uh, just dead. And they find the handmaids or the hand. The yeah. hand. Well, it's they find her dead, but it's the way Scorsese films it. Because yeah. you see her pale on the ground, but you think there's a sliver of a moment. Like, could she yeah. be alive? And then the camera cuts to a lower angle looking yeah. up where they lift her up and like the back, her of, back her of her head is gone is gone and it like again coming from just seeing it in theater that was like a moment where the audit you could hear visibly audibly hear the audience like oh like, yeah just kind of gasp at that and so he um Ernest is disgusted by this oh yeah oh um, yeah the the big thing is that Ernest in spite of going along with all this is clearly having reservations yeah. But all it takes is his uncle telling him, no, this is the plan. And he yeah. just kind of is able to remove that guilt from his mind. Interesting choice of words. Ernest is having reservations. Yeah. But no, that's very much the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. The the thing that this movie is doing is right at this point, that's the American experience that the movie is critiquing. Mm-hmm. Is the idea that as an American, um, there's a lot of things that America's done in its history and is doing now um, that you can that you have... That you will have guilt about. Yeah. That is part of being an American. And Ernest is the guy who's like, should we be doing this? And then he's told by his boss, um, his president, it's just like, no, it's fine. See, this is all part of the plan. Yeah, we have And Ernest to- is like, oh, it's part of the plan. Okay. Yeah. So. We should be funding Israel. Yeah. yeah. That's the past hundred years of American history is um, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, every your political persuasion, there's a version of this in history that you will find. Yeah, where it's just the authentic experience of being an American is being told by your boss, "Oh no, this is part of the plan." As you're seeing horrific, horrific awful, things awful happening. Things. Yeah. Um, and Leo, like many Americans, is like, "Okay, I'll go along with that because I can sleep better at night that way." Yeah, I'll keep doing what you tell me. Yeah. Um, with Molly or with a uh, Rita now dead, Molly's the final sister alive. Yeah. Oh, I really quick want to highlight. He, when Leo gets back to the house, he opens the door to the basement and Molly's just like, Oh my God. I can't even remember the exact wording, but she basically asks like, is like, are they? And, and Leo just shakes his head. Leo just shakes his head and Molly just screams. It's um, so guttural. That her entire family's now dead. It's all three of her sisters and her mother have died at this point. Yeah. Um, she just loses it with feeling like her, literally her people, her family is being butchered. executed. Butchered, yeah. I teared up at that. Yeah. That's a really brutal bit of performance from uh, Lily Gladstone. From Lily Gladstone. Yeah. Um, so the next bit, um, Molly does, even in her condition, this is a true story. I remember from the book that like even as like kind of feeble as she is, she decides to travel to DC herself mm-hmm. to beg for help from the government. Yeah, which she does. Calvin um, Coolidge, who's president at the Calvin time. Calvin Coolidge, everyone's favorite president. Um, she goes to DC, um, and she takes a very um, publicity style photo with the president. He has a bunch of Native Americans on the Capitol, and he takes his picture in the front of them, smiling. Um, and then the president's going to be whisked away. It was just a photo op. And she yeah. manages to like kind of grab and be like, please, my people are being executed, butchered. We need federal support. We need your help. Um, and Coolidge is very kind of dismissive in the scene. Yeah. But it do- he does actually pass that on to the recently formed Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah. Fun fact, this is the first case the FBI ever investigates. Wow, I didn't know it was their first. This is their first case. They are formed around the same time for this and the purposes of organized crime. Mm-hmm. Um, J. Edgar Hoover put into position of power, which he will continue for the next 60 years. Yeah. Um, so she goes back to 
um, Ocean Territory believing that she's failed um, because the Coolidge was somewhat dismissive. Yeah. Um, and her condition worsens as she continues to be poisoned. And I think it's very close in the scene when she is like bedridden. Yeah, she's bedridden at this point. Yeah. Um, while she's bedridden, Leo hears a knock at the door. Um, and this one, the movie kind of kicks into overdrive as my favorite person ever appears in this movie. You're a Jesse, uh, Plemons fan. Jesse Plemons is my fucking guy. Yeah. Um, have you seen game night? I have not. Game night. It's a Jason Bateman comedy. Okay. Jesse Plemons plays their next door neighbor who really wants to be invited to their game nights. And he's a cop and he's wearing the full cop outfit in every scene he's in, no matter where he is in the world on duty or off. And he just waits outside by his mailbox, holding his little dog, waiting for them to come by so he can ask them if they're having a game night. And they're like, nope, no game night. And Jason Mammon's holding three bags of Tostitos scoops. (laughs) And he's just like, three bags of Tostitos scoops, I notice. Jason Mammon's like, yep. Three for one deal. Three for one deal. How could that be profitable for Frito-Lay? (laughs) <laughs> it's just the best comic line delivery I've ever experienced in a movie. Yeah. Jesse Plemons has had this incredible golden run between Game Night, Power of the Dog, um, El Camino, this, The Irishman. He's great. He's my favorite guy. I love Fucking Jesse Plemons. Disrespectful to not acknowledge his humble beginnings in Breaking Bad. I said El Camino. That's not Breaking Bad. It's a Breaking Bad story. <laughs> that came out years after the yeah. final season. In which he looks significantly different. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, and that's not that is not shit that it's just very funny that that well, is set during the last season and nobody looks the if same. If you want to get a if you want to get a TV full range scoop of Jesse Plemons, you should watch his episodes in Breaking Bad and then watch Black Mirror season five, episode one, USS Callister. I've heard he's really good. At that. He's so. I won't get into it. I know you don't watch TV, but you should at least watch. I'm, Black I'm, gonna, Mirror. I'm becoming a TV guy next month. Okay, I decided. Watch Black Mirror um, season five, episode one, USS Callister. He is so good in that. All right, I'm gonna hit you with the the Jesse Plemons run. Um, okay, just just the hits from 2015 onward: Bridge of Spies, American Made, Hostiles, The Post, Game Night, Vice, The Irishman, El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. I'm thinking of anything: things. Judas and the Black Messiah, Jungle Cruise, The Power of the Dog, Antlers, Windfall, Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm thinking of ending things. Have you seen that? Yes, it's so good. Oh my He's God. incredible it's, on it. He's so good. <laughs> I'm thinking of ending things. Ah! He is my favorite current working actor of his generation. There's a lot of like specifiers in that sentence I just said, but I think you understand what I mean. Yeah. Well, um, listen, back in the early 2000s, I always said we needed a Matt Damon, Mark Wahlberg brother story. Yeah. And that never happened. Now we need him as the little brother. Now we need Jesse Plemons and Matt Damon as a brother. We have a new opportunity, folks. Yes. Do not blow this one, okay? We got to do because, it. Because, listen, I, I'm sorry to say, but Mark Wahlberg and Matt Damon have aged in not opposite, but different, different directions direction. to where they can't be cast as brothers anymore. However, we are now given a second chance <laughs> where Jesse Plemons is a Matt Damon knockoff. There, There is no movie um, where Jesse Plemons does not appear in where I do not get extremely excited. At one point, I said to my wife, I said, I could watch Jesse Plemons just read the labels off like a bottle of mustard. Um, and I'd be entertained. <laughs> and then I watched the power of the dog. Yeah. Um, where he is yeah. trying to woo Kirsten Dunst. And at one point Ugh. he, he goes in the kitchen with her. So good. At power and of the he dog. just, and he just sits down and he's trying to look for something to do. And I'm like, he's not gonna. And he grabs a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> he starts <laughs> just reading the label. And I was like, Oh my God, he's actually doing it. Um, he's like, this most wholesome sauce is great with fish, meat, and poultry. <laughs> and I'm like, great, great. Academy Award. I'm slapping it in his hand. Best supporting actor goes God, to. He's so good in Power of the Dog, too. Fuck. He's great in everything. He is so good in um, everything. And he's like not asked to do anything like difficult in this movie. He's not playing a uh, like particularly like morally complicated character. You said he's in Hostiles? He's in Hostiles. The I Christian Bale seen, one? Yes, I have not seen Hostiles. I've seen Hostiles. I'm trying to remember like who he was. Anyway, uh, back to Killers of the Flower no. Moon. Um in real life his character is like inexplicably the most noble cowboy to ever exist. In in this movie? Uh and just like in real life the character oh, oh, Tom okay. White. 
because like you read his story and it's like yeah every single white person involved in the story is complicit in murders and racism except for this one really noble cowboy who solved this whole murder and then went on to uh serve as a prison warden and then jumped in front of a child and took a bullet for a child this guy's like this guy's like crazy (laughs) But wow, the door opens and you get Jesse Plemons in the biggest hat you've ever seen. Yes, um, he's like here to see about them murders. See what who's mur- doing them. What about them murders? Uh, find out who's doing them. <laughs> um, and okay. <laughs> Leo gives like the worst um deflection ever. He's like, "No, you can't come in because my wife's sick." It's like, can we come back tomorrow? No, she'll still be sick. What about Friday? All right, she probably won't be sick on Friday. Can we, is she, can we just come in now? Yeah, he's like, is she home? Can I just like? And he's like, no, 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 no. Um, Tom like obviously immediately is suspicious of this guy. I was gonna say like literally from the get go, he gives away his like yeah. guilt. Even the Wikipedia synopsis of the next scene of the next few scenes is, um, Agent Tom White and his assistants come to investigate. It is immediately obvious to the investigators who is behind the plot. <laughs> <laughs> that is the Wikipedia description of the scene is it is immediately obvious who is behind the plot. And see, we can observe that and laugh at it, but it also lends more towards, again, Scorsese's direction with this and saying, like, look how quickly this thing got solved yeah. as soon as it got taken seriously. Yeah. And then the next, like, we're basically like, we just follow Tom White for like a little section. A little section, small section. Yeah. Where he just like. He goes to talk to people and they close up like clams. Like, you're not getting nothing from me. Yeah. And he talks, he literally just talks to some guy on the street. Yeah. Who's like, yeah, I can tell you who's doing it. Yeah. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, I was just, just. Yeah, I saw Anna get in a car with this guy. They said they went to a cemetery first. And then he talks to the driver. It's like, yeah, I took her to the cemetery. And then she got picked up by uh, Byron. B- Byron and this other guy. And then he talks to the other guy. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he looks like an evil mustache villain. He literally looks like he is from 1921. Like, they went back. Scorsese invented a time machine. If a jo- Traveled back, grabbed him, brought him into the present. If a jawline could have a date etched on it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> I looked up this guy. His name's Ty Mitchell. He's been in two movies. He's just an actual cowboy. Wow. Like, he's just, like, an actual rancher who a lot of people film on his land and he is now in, I guess two directors are like, just be in my movie. Yeah. That's Um, so good. But he talks to that guy who confesses everything. Who just opens up the books. Yeah. And like, yeah, it was so funny. Um, I'm starting to get lost now. Um, all the FBI guys meet up to kind of discuss what they figured out. Oh, and this is the, best cinematography of the entire movie yes because simultaneously um there's like a fire at the hale ranch yeah bill hale is deliberately burning his ranch yes so this is because when i saw it i'm like okay how does this connect to the scheme and then i it's not connected to the scheme it's a different scheme it's just kind of showing how bill works craven he is yeah for money that his all of his crop is on fire and all the FBI guys, including one of them who has been um, pretending to be an insurance salesman, yeah, um, are all meeting up. Oh, and he he's was like pretending to be an insurance. Salesman. I believe so. I just thought he was an insurance salesman that the FBI got on their side. That's also possible. I interpreted it as he was like undercover. Because isn't he the same guy who he took out the insurance policy on the I think Osage you're guy? You're right. And when De Niro has that second scene with him and he doesn't give him the money, he's like, listen, no, your claim is under dispute right now. I can't give you the money. Yeah. So I think you're right. I okay. think he is just the insurance guy who's helping the Because he gives the line, it's like, I just sold him a fire insurance policy last week. Yeah. And then one of the guys is like, well, I guess you're going to be working next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. It, it's a good line. It just shows how craven De Niro is that he's literally burning his own property for a quick buck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Which is the same way he views all the Osage people who he has insurance on. Is yeah. He's just burning them for a quick buck. And we don't go away from this night that quickly because what we then cut to is it's like, I can't describe what the shot is, but it's like, it's a extreme tight close up from a very, it's a long shot. Yeah. It's a very, very distant long shot. That's tight close up on like the flames with like the silhouettes of the guys working to put them out. Yeah. And it's like grainy and the fumes are distorting the If you've ever been to a desert and you look far into the distance and you see that shimmering heat, imagine that covering the frame. Yes. 
And it looks incredible. So good. Because in the silhouette, it looks like these guys are all killing each other. Yeah. Um, even though they're just trying to put out the fire. And as and it and it doesn't and it's not just one shot because it cuts from that to Molly's bedroom where De Nier, where DiCaprio is. DiCaprio who puts some poison in her insulin, but then he does something interesting that I couldn't quite quantify emotionally for me. Mm-hmm. Like as in I don't have like a take on it yeah. quite yet, which is he puts some of the poison in his whiskey. And drinks it. And drinks it. I think he's like, I'm going to suffer with you because he does love her. For me, I was like, uh, the way I sort of interpreted it is like, what does this poison do to her? I'm guessing the best I can interpret what it is, is it basically like just kind of fucks with your immune system. Well, no, I mean, that's what the character Ernest is thinking. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The, I, I, the way I interpreted mm-hmm. that scene when he gets the drops of poison, puts it in the insulin, and then he thinks for a moment and then puts in his drink, the closest thing I can come to as in my own, own interpretation is that Ernest at that moment is thinking, I wonder what this thing actually yeah. does, and then puts it in his drink to see how it feels. I kind of read it as like... Um, I know you're suffering. I want to suffer with you kind of thing. That, but also like in some deal with the devil way, like I'm going to punish myself as well for this. Mm. Um, It's like self-flagellation. Like I'm still going to hurt you, but I'm going to do it to myself too. Interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't know. know. It's, it's, you know, mark of a good movie is like, there's multiple ways to interpret it. Yeah. There's no wrong way to read that. Yeah. Except unless you're like, yeah, he just like the taste. That's probably the wrong way. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> the wrong way to think about that scene. Um, but it cuts from then like him helping Molly and he's like very drunk and also drugged up. Yeah. Um, he injects the insulin while she's sleeping. Yeah. And she tries to stop him, but he just does it. There's like the flames are refracting on the windows and mm. they have the blind shut through. And then, it, and then as it's cutting in and out from that to the long shot silhouette of the workers, mm. ugh, it's a great like kind of visual dream sequence yeah. in real life vibe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hale tries to have a few of his guys killed. Yes, who would know about that? It. That is what happens next. They're all very sloppy wax. They are. Yeah, because he try he tells them the guys he wants to kill. You should rob this guy. Yeah. And then he tells the guy he's about to get robbed. Hey, you're going to get robbed. You're going to get robbed to be on your guard with a shotgun. Or one of the common thing he likes to do is he tells people who he can presume to be suspects. Yeah. To get out of town, you're going to be suspected. So yeah. if he gets questioned, be like, well, did you talk to Jim? Oh, he left town? Oh, well, that's got to mean he's guilty. Yeah. It happens with, I, I I don't remember the guy's name, the Osage tribal guy who was uh, Molly's first husband. Henry. Henry. Who... His wife is having an affair with a guy, a white guy, and Henry. We really haven't talked much about Henry. I know this three and a half hours to talk yeah. about, but I do think this guy is worth a little bit of discussion. Yeah, this is a guy who uh, De Niro tries to help a lot, and this is where you've heard us reference that, like. This guy is drunk. Mm-hmm. He is depressed. He has attempted um, suicide in the past. Attempted suicide in the past, and De Niro constantly takes care of him and keeps him safe. And then the dialogue scene comes up where he's passed out right by the fireplace. Mm-hmm. There's De Niro and DiCaprio standing over his body while he's passed out next to the fire. And he's like, you know, the guy was Molly's first husband, right? He's like, oh, you don't say it. It's like... Well, she can have her secrets because you have yours. Yeah. And then he says like... And DiCaprio what? seems really upset by the prospect that Molly has secrets. Yeah. Because even though he's like, yeah, you have secrets from her, right? And he's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean she can have secrets from me. Yeah. And then De Niro, uh, DiCaprio then says like, why do you take care of this guy? Like, why? He's like, well, you know, he's a good old friend of mine, blah, 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 and all that stuff. And he owes me $25,000 yeah. and my insurance lapse in like a month or whatever. Yeah. And it's just like, oh my God. Just like the dialogue... But then the metaphor yeah. of the blocking is just ugh. there. There's another sequence in a similar vein where a guy has an insurance policy on like some kids and he's yeah. talking to the sheriff about if he should adopt the kids and if they were to die, would he would the money go to him? And the sheriff just bluntly says, like, it sounds like you're trying to kill your kids for the money. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, well, not if there's no money to be had. Right. Then it's not legal. Um, it's just like it's both like 
a joke, but a really dark one. Yeah, um, that these white people are so malevolent and stupid. He, yeah, he doesn't know if he wants to adopt a kid. To... Well, it's like you live in a society where it becomes so acceptable, you start talking about it like it's just, yeah, just accept- casually. Casually, like it's acceptable. Um, but the, the FBI figured everything out, and so they arrest everyone involved. They, they, yeah, they first, they first arrest Ernest, and they have a, like this weird interrogation scene with him. But they don't let him sit down. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, can I sit down? It's like, uh, well, you could, but you're standing. Yeah, you could, but you <laughs> they won't. They never say, like, he can't sit down. Yeah, they just don't provide a chair. They just don't provide a chair, and they don't tell him explicitly he can sit down. And they basically trick him into perjuring himself by agreeing, like, oh, I had nothing to do with it. And then they open the door to one of the co-conspirators. Blackie. Blackie who's like, yeah, I, I, sorry, Ernest, I told him everything. Yeah. Um, so then they, they also coincident. They also meanwhile find Molly, um, nearly dead, and rush yeah. her to a hospital where she gets better. Yeah, where she starts recovering right away because they give her normal insulin and not poison. poisoned insulin. Um, and so Ernest is pressured into um, testifying, testifying against uh, his uncle Hale. Yeah. Um, in exchange for he'll will be he'll be allowed to return to his wife and kids, which is what he keeps insisting is all he wants. He'll get essentially full immunity. Yes, what it sounds like and protection. Yes, great deal. Yes, he's getting the best deal. Yeah, that, that's that. As a, if you're a criminal, that's the deal you want is like yeah. testifying someone else uh, the, for immunity, unless you think you'll right. get whacked. In, but but then, case. oh yeah, the, are we are we at it? You folks are we uh, at it? <laughs> we, well, Jeff Jeff Goldblum style, you folks might be asking. Um, is there going to be some Brendan Fraser on your Brendan Fraser your podcast? podcast? Um, because yes, Hello? there is. Uh, because Leo is brought into the courtroom, um, and it's just this tracking shot, and you get to see Hale on the defense stand with his lawyer, lawyer. W. S. Hamilton, played by Brendan, Brendan Fraser. Fraser. Opposite him is John Lithgow. John Lithgow. <laughs> Oh! Um, as the prosecuting attorney, who who is noted as saying, "I would work at the craft service table to work in a Scorsese movie. This is a lifelong dream for me fulfilled." Lest we not forget that our travolting roots began very shortly with John Lithgow and Blowout in Blowout, and how, uh, aren't we so happy? We do love John Lithgow. Fucking happy to see John Lithgow again on screen on our podcast. We're thrilled to have John Lithgow back in the picture. That c- I could honestly do a Lithgow pass. We could do we could do Lithgow. Um he has an interesting career. He has an in- I'm, I'm kind of looking at it now and it's like he's in a lot of good stuff. I don't know if there's really an arc to track here, but well, there's a TV. Listen, if we did Lithgow, we'd have to do TV. Yeah. You simply would have to. I I agree. Because he has a whole thing in Dexter, which is known to be like the best season of Dex- Dexter ever when he's the Trinity killer. Because like the, the, the Lithgow thing is he starts playing like kind of like murderous freaks in movies. Yeah, because he looks like your suburb dad. Yeah, and then he starts just playing dads um, from the 90s onward. And then he has a comeback as a murderous freak with Dexter. But since then, he's just kind of been playing grandpa. In yeah. Interstellar, Daddy's Home Two, Pitch Perfect Three, Pet Cemetery. Okay, yeah. As you're saying it, maybe <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't be that interesting, but I just love John Lithgow. I do love John Lithgow too. He's great. I watched Rise of the Planet of the Apes a few days ago. He's great in that. He is so good. as John Lith as a uh, James Franco's <laughs> Alzheimer's ridden father. And you guys might who be causes thinking, the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> and you guys might be thinking, like, okay, great, we finally got to Brendan Fraser. Now is he just like a fly in the wall in this movie? Does he have a very well? You, you might be thinking. <laughs> so, I I texted you. I texted you, and I said you're not prepared for the energy with which Brendan enters this movie. <laughs> no, I wasn't prepared. Because I wasn't. Did I'm, I tell you when? As soon as before he even says his thing. Yeah. When we get to that tracking shot, I was sitting next to a couple I did not know. Yeah. And the moment it cuts to that other side of the courtroom and you see Brendan Fraser, I literally ought to be like. God, it's Brendan Fraser. <laughs> the dude, yeah. it was like a couple, and the guy was sitting next to me. He clearly looked over at me, yeah. like, "Okay, cool." Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, "Okay, well, we're gonna get into a courtroom scene, and Brendan will like kind of be able to give his, you know, opening address, and it'll be a, ve- a fairly normal en- introduction." He'll be him. like, uh, 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 "Objection, Your Honor, can we have a recess?" Like something very mild, like that, yeah. right? Uh, no, we we cut to DiCaprio, and he's asked to testify, and then it's just you just start hearing, "No, you." <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. The room starts shaking in the theater. Um, we cut back to Brent, who rises 
like as almost if it was a direct continuation of the end of the whale. <laughs> he just rises. That's up. what you wanted to say. Yes, that's what it? I wanted to say. Okay. He just rises up and say, "Your Honor, this man is my client, client and I have not <laughs> had the opportunity to speak to my client." <laughs> it is incredible. incredible. <laughs> it's so good because I feel like it is such a different performance than anything else in this movie yes um because he's he's playing like the final id of what de nero represents which is like de nero's like a, a sheep in wolf's clothes or a wolf in sheep's clothing and he's just a wolf <laughs> he's just like this bloviating out of town lawyer who's brought in to just cause a ruckus and yell yeah it's such a perfectly calibrated performance to really throw you off your rocker at this point in the movie. Yeah, because you're this, just not expecting him to get up and start yelling. This entire movie has been a varying dynamic of quiet scenes with yeah. some explosive moments. Yeah, but you're not. The movie trains you to not quite be ready and prepared for the Brendan Fraser yeah. blowout there, of the courtroom. There's no, none of the performances in this movie are theatrical. And yes. Except for Brendan. And I say that as a compliment. I, I think so, too. Because that's like the lawyer he's playing. Yeah. Like, that's exactly what you want De Niro's lawyer to be My like. client has been missing for two, two months. <laughs> and I must <laughs> speak, speak with, with him. him. His like, arms are raised like he's feeling the light of God. <laughs> um, and the and Lithgow's like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> he is. He's doing his, He's like, your honor, that's not part of the rules. He cannot be both his client. <laughs> <laughs> I must speak Did with him. Like, oh my god! And so the judge is like, "All right, court's adjourned." <laughs> <laughs> he really does it out of yeah. exacerbation. Yeah, he's like, "It's, it's a, we'll come back on Monday. You can yeah. meet with your fucking client." Oh my god! Um, but and it's not a throwaway scene either because it's so important. Because had that not happened, he would have testified, and the movie would have been over. Yeah. He would have just been like, yep, my uncle did it. <laughs> but that one scene just expanded it like an extra yeah. 20, 30 Brendan minutes. Brendan gives you another 20 to 30 of this movie. Yeah. Um, through his through his his great work. I would say that's one of two of his great great scenes in this movie. Oh, yes. He He's basically, in the background of a few. Yeah, he has, but he only really has like two scenes to do things. Yeah. You good? You good? Yeah, my... I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, yeah. He gets him out of the courtroom. And yes. then we're at Hale's house. Well, so they're all brought to the Masonic. Leo is told that he's oh. going to be brought to the Masonic Temple okay, that night. Okay. I think Byron brings him. Yes, I think so, too. Um, where Hale is still locked up in prison because he's being prosecuted. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, the one of the more astonishing visuals of the movie. I agree. Where This is the trailer shot. Yes. Because all, you, all you've seen in this Masonic Temple is just De Niro, Byron, and Leo. Um, you're just like, those are the three conspirators, and they mm-hmm. contract out other people. Yeah. And Leo gets brought in, and the entire town is in the temple. The white Every town. white person. Every white who person. Who you've seen in this movie. The doctors, the bankers, like the yeah. storefront managers. very early in the movie, you're introduced to the line, can you spot the wolves in this picture? Yeah. And you think that you're smart, because you're like, oh, well, it's clearly De Niro. Yeah. And the thing you don't comprehend is... It's everybody. Every single person in this town is in on it. Yeah. They're not just all like silently complicit. They're the all explicitly complicit. Yeah. It's the sheriff. It's the guy from No Country. The Guardians, yeah. The Guardians. It's Fraser. Every single white. The doctors. Yeah. Everybody's in this temple and they're like, you have to get your uncle out of this. It's like, yeah. Are you trying to get your uncle in jail? Yeah, are you he trying to built, get him killed? He, he built this town. And then. And so, like, it, the scene starts with everybody having their little bit of a uh, interaction, but then mm-hmm. Fraser takes over the scene with DiCaprio because he then sits down next to him and he, like, has this conversation of, like, listen, like, did they offer you a deal? Yeah. He's like, well, yeah, it's a good deal. I just want to see what it's like. Do you, like, it's the federal government. You think you can trust the federal government? Yeah. Like, they're going to they're gonna fry you. Yeah. Okay? Like, they're going to put your uncle in jail and then they're going to kill you. Like, mm. so are, do you want to die? Do you want your uncle to die? Like, because if your uncle dies, you die next. Like, doing a really good job. Brendan's like, doing a lot of good work in this scene. With DiCaprio. The yeah. two of them, like, this is where I said, like, it's such a great way to end this podcast where it's like we get to see this guy act with, like, the best of the best. Yeah. And hold his own. He's and just, hold his own. He's playing a very theatrical character, but that's but that that's, a, that's a feature. That fits, yeah. He's so great in this little scene. Yeah. Um, I like when he's like, dumb boy. Dumb boy. He calls Leo dumb boy. Yeah. 
It's ah, it's so good. So good. I was thrilled by everything happening in this scene. Me too. And he's like, you're going to tell them. He's like, they tortured you, right? And Leo's like, what? what? He's like, they tortured, tortured you, you, right? <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, they tortured me. He's like, great. So we're all set. Um, th- Those are basically the extent of the Fraser, like, meat of the movie. Mm-hmm. Is like his introductory scene, which is so good. And then the scene, which is basically just him and DiCaprio. They're like, they're the two guys in that scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it, it is just a really lovely little performance yeah. at the end of this movie to really hype you up. Yeah, it is. Um, and so Leo's kind of been co-opted into not, he tells Tom White, I'm not going to testify anymore. Yeah. Well, he first goes to Molly. Yeah. And him and Molly have that conversation. And this is where like, I'm almost like at this point in the movie thinking like I'm in disbelief of how much Molly doesn't still know. Yeah. Versus how much she doesn't believe. Mm. And it's just, mind boggling to me that like he's sitting in front of her being like my uncle's in jail for killing all your people because I told lies. Yeah. Cause that's not actually what happened mm. and I need to go and make this right or whatever. And she's sitting there like, okay, like, yeah, she just, their love is so genuine. The two of them, their love is so genuine and pure that she just wants to believe him. Um, even if all the evidence is against it, she can't accept that he's lying to her yeah um and so she is still like okay and you know hugs him and kisses him even as you know distressed and you know distraught as she is by and she's base physically almost been like brought back to life yes from a health standpoint she looks dead behind the eyes though she like, does ev- like her whole family's dead it yeah. might have been her husband who did it um yeah all she has left to hold on to is their love. That's the only thing left in her life. Yeah. Um, yeah. that she's grasping on to. Um, and so Leo, you know, agrees is not going to testify. He gets locked up along with his uncle. Yeah. And then it's he, a, Jesse Plemons comes to him in the middle of the night, tells him that his, one of his kids died. One of his kids died of whooping cough. And he's like, well, who? And it's like, I don't know. I didn't get a name. Somebody yeah. with lung issues. It's like, oh my God, it was Hannah. Yeah. And this was a really good performance on, Di- on DiCaprio's yeah. part. Like he, he plays it off like, you know, a very genuinely loving, caring father. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I love about this scene is like what really switches him is like Anna, by all counts, died of just actual sickness. Ickness. Or ickness. Sickness. Sickness. Yes. Um, but he doesn't know that. He could, st- he's st- still grappling with the fact of was she killed because I am potentially going to testify like is she being killed because she's indian this was your interpretation i interpret that like that's kind of what he's grappling with is like did i just get my daughter killed oh like i I guess i didn't i think in the context of reality like she actually just did get sick and die but i think he's really grappling in this moment with like i know she has had lung issues has she had lung issues because she's been poisoned is this a scheme that's been getting pulled? Oh, I guess I never really made that connection per- personally. Because to me, it was just him mourning the loss of his daughter that he truly loved. And it t- what makes that scene go from really good to great is then De Niro coming out and playing like the malevolent snake of like, oh, she's with the Lord now, which is what he said to Molly when mm. they discovered Anna's body. Yeah. Cause he just says like, Oh, it's okay. Molly Anna's with the Lord now. Like yeah. and trying to be that like caring figure. And he says the exact same thing. Um, and it just feels like he's doing the same thing to mm-hmm. DiCaprio that he just did to Molly. Yeah. Like only now it's his daughter. Yeah. Who, but in De Niro's eyes is just another Indian half breed. Yeah. You know? So and that's the, why I kind of interpret this. It is. Oh, sorry. As DiCaprio wrestling with the fact that maybe she was killed mm. or like he might have some part to blame for her death. And that's kind of what changes his mind about testifying. Definitely has some part to blame. I kind of felt yeah. that a little bit, like just this whole situation. Yeah. And so he, he tells his uncle, I'm going to testify against you. Yeah. And his uncle's like, you think that they're really going to let you be with your family again? This is the federal government we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Um, but then he does testify mm-hmm. and he opens up about everything. Everything. 
We're cutting between him and Molly. Him, Molly, and then Hale and Fraser. Fraser gets on all of these shots because he's sitting right next to De Niro. He doesn't have a line. But... He has no lines, but it's just really great that it's cutting between the three main characters and then also Brendan yeah. Fraser is present in the frame. Yeah. Well, the entire scene is just Lithgow asking yeah. uh, Ernest questions and Ernest just saying yes, no, and all that stuff. And explaining how each, how involved he was in each of the sisters' deaths, yeah. specifically. Um, and then we're cutting to Molly, and she's seeing through flashback in her head. Oh, my God. The I... murder of her siblings as, you know, complicit by her husband. It, it, it was Anna's death that just, like, broke me yeah. the most. Because you see the way the work's in a flashback is you, they show you Anna getting killed. They show Anna being picked up by Byron and that other guy. Mm. Um getting led to the woods and 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 if i recall it directly cuts from anna the daughter's funeral to anna the sister's death in flashback i think so too yeah yeah because in he's sort of the not byron but the other guy who's there at the at the killing he sort of fumbles out the gun and Mm -hmm. like hold her up hold her up and then shoots her and they just quietly walk away and the next thing thing it cuts to is byron getting home late from supposedly what molly thinks is just dropping her sister off he just like fumbles onto the bed, falls asleep, and Molly comes in, puts a pillow under his head, and then she goes back upstairs yeah. and sleeps with her husband. And we're seeing that through her POV and eyes, almost like without saying it, without writing it, just through the visuals of the scene, it's like, I did that. Yeah, she's now seeing all the wolves yeah. in the sheep in sheep's clothing that she's been surrounded by. Yeah, such an impactful scene. And so Leo testifies, and then he's brought back to the, the holding area. Mm-hmm. Uh, him and Jesse Plemons are hanging out, which is like my dream. Um, <laughs> me and Jesse just hitting up the town. Um, and then Molly comes in to see him. They bring in Molly, yeah. And she asks, did you poison me? That's all she wants to know is the truth, is did you poison me? She, the specific question she says is, what was in the insulin? Mm-hmm. And he just looks at her kind of confused. Yeah. We might, we, th- I can see this scene being interpreted different ways. Mm-hmm. Here's how I interpreted it. Molly walks in and sits down. And I think Ernest starts the scene off of being like, you have to understand, like I would never have done anything to hurt you yeah. or anything for our kids. And she just says, what was in the insulin? Mm-hmm. And he just kind of looks at her very confused. It's like, what? Uh, it was just insulin, mm-hmm. which is like, Again, my interpretation, a half truth, because mm-hmm. he didn't think he was poisoning her. Yeah, he just thought he was slowing her down. He just thought he was slowing her down, but he he did he is knowingly putting something in her insulin. Yeah, so he's telling her a half truth, and but he's still lying to her that he would never hurt her. Yeah, because in his mind, he doesn't think he ever would. Even right. though he did. Even though he did. But in Molly's eyes, she, as you just said, the veil goes away and she yeah. sees the wolf. Yeah, and that he is, from the beginning, been involved in this. And, and she just gets up and walks silently away. Silently gets up, walks out. <clears throat> and the detail that I love, before we cut away, is Leo looks at Tom White as if asking for, like, what should I do next? Because all he lives with is people telling, telling him, him what, what to, to do. do. Yeah. And after just like such an emotional blow as that, he needs someone to tell him what to do. And so he turns to the FBI, like, what mm. should I do? Yeah. And then we cut away. Mm. And that's essentially the end of the movie. In terms of the story that is being told, that's the end of the movie. Yeah. We cut like 40 years in the future mm-hmm. at this point. Um, and we get an epilogue. <clears throat> Sorry. We get an epilogue sequence. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a hokey radio show. Um, called True Stories of the FBI or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah, it's a true crime podcast, <laughs> but on the radio. <laughs> yeah, it's like an OG true crime podcast. Yeah. Um, but it's a live performance as well. Yeah, for a stage. I I've actually attended one of these <clears throat> before in oh, Ball State. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. They they do it for plays sometimes or audio plays mm. or some something like that. But they had a guy like doing uh live foley work. Yeah, and I would like to. Did you? Figure, did you clock who any of these guys are on the stage? Not other than the last guy, because uh, it's Jack White. Um, <clears throat> is the the is one of the actors, 
And then the guy doing the voice is Larry Fessenden, who we've actually talked about on this show before. <laughs> really? He was in um in a valley of violence. Oh, okay. <coughs> Sorry. Interesting. Um, but yeah, it's those two. It's just like a bunch of performers, and they're essentially recapping what happened afterwards. The, that at the end of a movie, when you usually get those like blocks of text to explain what happened, all the characters they're doing that. They're doing this instead, but in like a very hokey way. Yeah, of being like, "What a crazy story, isn't it?" And they're like, they're doing silly sound effects and making derivative uh, Native American noises. Because then you think about it, like again, I I think it's no accident that De Niro or. De, uh, Scorsese yeah. is putting this in a framework of what we know today, which is a true crime podcast yeah. only in the seventies true crime yes. radio. And it's very much like, yeah, this is like a story you probably listened to on a half an hour podcast on your drive home. Mm-hmm. And then you forgot about it two minutes later. And then you're like, that's interesting. Yeah. And then uh, just that didn't that put any thought into it because then they, the, the radio announcer says like, so William W K Hale got sentenced to life. But then got released in like what? Tw- he per- got paroled in like nineteen um, forty something. Yeah, nineteen forty something, and then it was like barely twenty years, yeah. not even twenty years. And he didn't die of poverty; he died like decently. Yeah, uh, he never achieved his old wealth, but well, and they say that he got released because of his previously clean record and good yeah. behavior. And Hale, in spite of everything, basically got to live a full life. A full life. Um, Ernest died, um, at, Ernest also gets released and then dies living with his brother Byron. Yeah. Um, and then, and so we're given there's what happened to those people and like the investigation itself all through this kind of hokey lens of like a true crime. Let me tell you this crazy story. And then the announcer, the last thing he says is that, and then Molly, um, went on to, raise her children on her own mm-hmm. and then she, when she passed away in 1950 something or 60 something yeah. I want to say there were four lines in her obituary and then mm-hmm. he pauses and the actor steps away and Martin, Martin Scorsese, Scorsese himself walks onto the stage walks onto the stage and reads Molly's obituary yeah um, which is just four lines it's basically she um, do you have it up I do not have it up. Um, I have the summary of it. Yeah, I mean, even the summary is. Um, I'm going to see if I can bring up the actual obituary. Okay. Um, it, it It is just a very... Molly Burkhart. Um, Molly Burkhart. This is... Your audience is loving this right now. Okay, I cannot find the actual obituary. But... um. It's basically like it says, like, she... Um, oh, she remarried. Yeah, she remarried, died age 50 in 1937 from diabetes, and was buried with her family. Scorsese reads this all very respectfully. That Basically, the crowd goes quiet. All the sound effects stop. All the other actors essentially disappear from the movie. Yeah. Um, he reads her obituary, puts it down. Oh, I got it. It's yes. Molly Cobbs. Yes. She remarries. Molly Cobbs was born December 1st, 1886 at Gray Horse, Oklahoma, and died June 16th in Fairfax at the age of 50 years, six months and 15 days. She was survived by her husband, John Cobb, and other relatives. Services were held Friday, June 18th from Sacred Heart Catholic Church with Father Albert, uh, whatever, officiating. Uh, interment was in Interment was in the Gray Horse Cemetery. And so then, he finishes reading that. And then he kind of lowers it <clears throat> um, and just says her obituary omitted any mention of the murders. The murders are mentioned nowhere in her obituary. Yeah. And Scorsese just kind of leaves us with that silence for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, we fade away from the actual image of Martin Scorsese reading that. Mm-hmm. And then we just get a drone helicopter shot of a modern day Osage um uh, um, it's like sacred, tribal dance, yeah, sacred <clears throat> dance. There's like hundreds, there are hundreds of them, and they're dancing in a big circle, yeah, um, around a central like um, people playing the drum, yeah, um, the drums. And we go up and we see the scale of them that their culture still endures today. Mm-hmm. Cut to black, directed by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, um, I just wanted that last scene is so small. I just wanted to say it before oh. we talk yeah, yeah, about yeah. the whole, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
Because to me, that is really what I left thinking about as the movie, that last scene. Because mm-hmm. this, the whole thing is like just this incredible epic about so many topics, um, so much about America and American history. Mm-hmm. But this last scene is the thing I keep coming back to is yeah, how much Scorsese is criticizing his own work here while also emphasizing the need for it. Mm. Mm. Because at the end of the day, he is, you know, drawing the direct comparison between this hokey radio show and the movie that you've just watched. Yeah. Which at the end of the day, you got a bucket of popcorn and you went to, and you went to go see a movie that you hoped entertained you about a serious topic. But yeah. You go to the movies for entertainment. Murder mystery. Yeah. You went for a murder true crime mystery. Yeah. That is, that is the movie that, you know, you watched. That yeah. is the movie that you were presented. He presented it to you that way. Um, and he's drawing the direct comparison between that and this hokey radio show. He's like, what is the difference between what I have done and this? There is not much difference. I hope I've dealt with it somewhat respectfully. But then when he comes out at the end himself, I think that's really just to emphasize, first and foremost, that he wants to put himself in the crosshairs here. Where mm. it's like, yep, I'm a part of this traveling troupe. I'm a part of this whole radio show that's exploiting the story. For yeah. Her. If this hokey radio retelling seemed a bit crude, yeah. why, were, why are you all here? Yeah. I'm part of this. Yeah. So I want to put myself in the crosshairs here. Um, Scorsese's Catholic guilt continues on. Yeah. It's one of his uh, great um, great things. Yeah. But also, in the respect that he gives Molly through this obituary reading, yeah. and ending with her obituary omitted any mention of the murders, mm-hmm. he's basically saying, like, would this story, would anybody know this story nowadays if we hadn't just told it to you? Or if it was written in a book. Yeah, like, what level what is the level of complicity we all have in these stories Mm -hmm. or in these historical tragedies? By simply not remembering or recognizing them. Yeah. Do we, is it incumbent upon us to tell these stories, even if the morals of us telling these stories as white people who are, you know, consuming it for entertainment, is that fucked up? Is that wrong? Or is it more fucked up to forget these stories? And I don't think he has an answer to that question. I don't think he remotely understands the answer to that question. I think he's just leaving you with the question. Yeah. Just keep telling the story, and we will debate this to the end of time. But he is just consumed with this guilt. I think, Jeff, you just perfectly summed up what was something I was about to ask, but I think you kind of already answered in your own question, which was not something I a hundred percent agree with, but I wanted to put a hypothetical on the table for us to sort of think about, but I think you may have already answered it, which is we, this is certainly not a white savior. movie. I'll say, get that out of the way, but, but can, we can agree that there are movies that aren't white savior movies, but are still like, the incorrect POV yeah. movies. And I don't mean that in character. I mean that as the, the filmmaker, mm-hmm. how many times have we watched something and we think there's something wrong with this because of who is telling this story. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that about this movie, but what I am saying is, is it fat? I'm, uh, put the put it into words. Put it into words. I see what you're. I see what you're. Well, I'm saying about. it's like I can f- I can imagine a person sitting with us and asking us the question: Was Martin Scorsese the right person to tell this mm-hmm. story? Yes. I'm not saying if that's a viewpoint I share or agree or disagree yeah. with. The but it, qu- it's definitely a valid discussion. Yeah. To have. Um, if he was the right, and I think that's what the question he's running head first onto in this last scene. Yeah, he wants to cut off someone asking the question and say, no, I'm asking that same question. Like I'm consumed by guilt as a white person in America and felt the need to tell this story, um, to try and alleviate that guilt <clears throat> and portray and put you in the mindset of how evil and terrible this was. And essentially the whole movie is an act of self flagellation, mm-hmm. um, of just kind of, as a white person, just torturing yourself with the evils of white people. 
mm-hmm. of him just being like, these people are terrible. They're awful. Their name should not, their name should be mud for all time. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I am continuing to remember their names and I am telling you a story for your entertainment. Um, but I'm doing it out of this place of guilt and I don't know what any of that means. So I'm going to put myself here at the end looking into the camera. Basically b- asking you, did this work? And you watched this in theaters, so I he does yeah. the directorial thing where he appears before the audience, before the movie yes. even starts. To, I feel like, which is also calculated to make sure that when you get to the end of the movie, um, you know who he is. You know who he is, yeah. There, there's no attempt to disguise... The, this is not a cameo where he's trying to disguise the fact that it's Martin Scorsese in this movie. Right. It is explicitly him playing himself yeah. at the end of this movie. Yeah, right. Right. And so I don't think there's really an easy answer to this question or to the end of this movie. I think there's many interpretations. And at the end of the day, I think it's just a discussion that culturally we should and will continue to have. Does he do interviews? Oh, he does so many interviews. I would love to like read an in-depth interview about his like thought process on this. I... When one comes out, he hasn't done any post-movie things yet. Yeah. He's done a lot of discussions like pre-movie, which yeah. are all incredible. He's an amazing interview. Um, but the second he starts doing like the post-movie interview circuit, um, I will send you whatever comes out about yeah. this sequence. Because I don't think you're far off. I mean, that I it wasn't something I clocked. I didn't yeah. know how to feel when yeah. I saw him. When I saw him come out, I was like, like what is this for? for yeah not that i didn't feel like there was a place for it but i just couldn't put put it into words of like how is this making me feel right now Mm. but now as you said it it's like him sort of cutting you off before you ask the question that he is very much asking of like am i really the right person to tell Mm -hmm. this kind of a story like i did it i told it i told this story would would anyone else he's like i don't know if anyone else would have remembered who molly burkhart was yeah and told the story of these murders but at the same time, does that make it okay for me to have been the person? Yeah, <clears throat> right. And I don't know. Yeah. It makes me wonder, like, how many people are going to watch this movie and still make those comments in their yeah. somewhat. I am not. I don't want to get, like, too much in their face, mm-hmm. but in some sort of pleasant way, like, missing the point. Yeah. Like, they watch this movie and they'd be like, yeah, it was fine. I didn't think Mark Scorsese was a voice to say the story. Yeah. And it's like, did you not watch the last yeah. scene? Like, he's starting a dialogue he's opening a conversation with the audience yeah and he's asking you to like not just walk out and be like was well, he the, he's not the right like he's asking you let's let's have this conversation culturally because right. he's not let's saying discuss. it's wrong but he's yeah. saying like it's worth talking about. yeah he's like i don't know i don't know tell me um it's like you know i mentioned his catholic guilt but it's like so many of his movies are about not catholic knowing guilt. if you've done the right thing yeah right yeah and um, feeling guilt about every choice you make. Mm-hmm. And that's so much of this last scene. God, it's why I love silence I so much. I think it's one of the most like audacious final scenes in a movie I've ever seen. Yeah. Like it's, it, it's not a place you ever expect a movie to go. Like you've, right. I've, we've all seen movies that are self criticizing mm-hmm. and are meta or have some sequence at the end where it like kind of directly addresses itself. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever seen anything to this degree. Or like this. That questions basically its entire existence. Yeah. Um, and doesn't give you an answer mm-hmm. about it. I just think that's really audacious. And um, as someone who is, you know, a cinephile, just kind of inspiring to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is great. Yeah. I, I think that's all I have to say about I was like, we really that. can't say much about post text of how much it made because it's still in the process. I can tell you it. what it made opening weekend. <laughs> what did um, it make opening weekend? Um, so movie just came out this past Thursday, as I said, um, October 20th, 2023, um, it's currently the 22nd as we record. Yeah. This. this is Sunday, the 22nd. So we're not even fully out of opening weekend yet. Yes. Um, so movie, um, this movie cost $200 million. Quite hefty. Um, but it was funded by a streaming service. So the box office is calculated in a different way. Sure. Apple doesn't need this thing to break even. They need this thing to make a few dollars um, and then 
put and it attract people to watch it on a streaming service. Yeah, yeah, right. Because if they didn't put this thing in theaters and they just put it on the streaming service, it still would have cost $200 million, um, and they just would not have made any direct profit off of it. So this is kind say, of is all this, free profit. Is this them. for better or for worse? Um, I think this is somewhat the ideal scenario for modern movie making. I ask because I truly do not know. I, I think like the old distribution model is the best one. Like the one that we grew up in where it's like movies in a theater. It is just in a theater. And then four DVDs. months later, there's a DVD. Yeah. That's like the best model for the sustainability of the industry. Mm. That is not the, that's just not possible anymore. And so the best we can kind of want now, unless you get like your miracle movies, like your Top Gun Mavericks or Avatar or whatever, or Oppenheimer and Barbie even, mm-hmm. where, you know, it makes a lot of money in the theater and then it does actually do like the, all right, it's now rentable. You can buy now buy the Blu-ray and then it will go on a streaming service next year. Mm-hmm. Um, with exi- Aside from those like kind of specific examples, um, for a movie like this, if you kind of, I mean, this is basically the only way for like a $200 million Martin Scorsese um, three and a half hour long drama to get made. Yeah. is like a streaming service has to pay for it out of their streaming budget, mm-hmm. which is just like a, you know, a billion dollars. And then every year in profit, they make 1.5 billion. Yeah. And that's the only way to calculate your profits. But then when they go the next year and spend another billion, when last year they only made 1.5 billion off of that $1 billion budget, aren't they taking a half a million dollar loss? Well, essentially if like if they spend a billion dollars on making stuff and they make 1.5 billion, right. They come out with 0.5 billion at the end. Um, profit gain. Oh, just, yeah, profit. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they and make so now, the one billion back. Yeah, to fund next year, but with the yeah, uh, and but they sorry, make point five billion. Yeah, economic math just didn't register um, in my brain. Okay, okay, okay. And so, which is kind of the weird way of how streaming because there's no like direct profit margin through a streaming service. Like, right, you can spend ten dollars on a movie or two hundred million dollars on a movie, and at the end of the day, through a streaming service, both of them are gonna read you that they're making the same profit. Yeah. Because someone's just paying a, sub- a subscription fee every month. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like how? How? And so Apple putting this in theaters, at the end of the day, it's just free pro- It's free money to them. <laughs> it's like this came out of the streaming budget. This thing can make $10. And it's like, yeah, we've made a $10 profit on this movie because it came out of the streaming budget. Yeah. Right. Uh, which goes to say this movie has made $23 million in its opening weekend in the U.S., with 21 internationally for 44 million overall. Okay, so about uh 20 20% of its budget? Yeah, about 2025. Um somewhere in that range. And it'll make I think I think it'll probably make up to like I would I don't think it'll go half. Yeah, it I think it'll probably come out to like 110 120 million. You think it'll go over half? I think it'll go over half. Okay. Um which for this type of movie is like it's Martin Scorsese's like third best opening weekend, which is crazy to say. Wow. Um, so for a movie like this, that's good. That's great. Yeah. Oppenheimer was a very specific incident where that movie happened to make nine hundred and twenty-five million dollars. That's a complete accident that Oppenheimer <laughs> happened to be such a major success. Wow. Um, that movie made more money than most superhero movies. It's inexplicable, but it's great. And it's a Christopher Nolan. Yeah, it's like a three-hour Christopher Nolan World War II drama. Yeah, crazy. Um, but that's more. That movie's a little more propulsive than this. So you and can Barbie see. broke a billion. Barbie did break a billion. Barbenheimer, a uh, huge success. They should do it again. Yeah, Barbenheimer too. Um, Electric Boogaloo. Mm-hmm. Point being, this movie is not going to make a traditional profit. But that doesn't matter. We don't have to calculate that. Yeah. For what this movie is, which is a three and a half hour long, incredibly grim drama, this is gr- this is massive gains. Yeah. You said 110. I I think yeah. it'll cap out at 88. I don't think it'll get to 90. You think it'll double its opening weekend? I think it'll double its opening weekend, and that'll be it. We will check back in on this um, in some episode in a few weeks. Yeah, we should. We should. I I hope I'm sur- surprised. Because, like, I want to look at some earlier Scorsese movies. Like, I just looked at Casino, which made $116 million off a $50 million budget. Is that a fair comparison? 
I think it's fair comparisons. Like Gangs of New York, a hundred million dollar budget made one hundred ninety three. These movies don't make like monstrous profits. They usually this one is particularly expensive because of the setting. Yeah. Um. So in comparison to the rest of his work, it's gonna probably equal out. It just happens that this movie has a very big budget, but it's the whole streaming. Play. I'm only saying is that fair? Because like, what about the Irishman? Oh, I should. The Irishman cost about the same as this. The Irishman, however, did not have a major theatrical release. You're right. The I I saw the, I did see the Irishman in theaters, but it was limited release only. It was limited release. I saw it at the Landmark Cinema, Chicago, our worst theater. Uh, we salute it. Aren't they out um, of business? No, they're still there. Oh. They're showing David Fincher's The Killer this weekend. Oh, you know where I'm not going to see The Killer? There. Landmark, yeah. <laughs> um. Is yeah, there but is there profit like statements on the IRS? Oh yeah, that movie made eight million dollars at the box office, off of a hundred and sixty million dollar budget. Again, hard to compare because it is yeah because it released in like three theaters and you had to like pay off a homeless guy in front to get access. But like, and of course, then it goes on streaming, and so then you how can you trust any budget profit yeah. numbers? But like, do, are there any reported outside of the box office? Nope. There's no there's no way to tell. Like, yeah, you, I know. Netflix could tell you how much how many people watched it, right? But every time Netflix tells you how many people watched it, it's the most people who's ever watched the Netflix thing. Go on their social media. It's so every time a movie comes out, it's like this is the most watched movie in Netflix. <laughs> I'm like, they can't. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way. Ten billion people watched Red Notice. Yeah. I refuse to accept it. Yeah. No. Huh. Um. So this is we are this is just like kind of a brave new world of, you know, box office reporting. Scary. So it's weird to say this movie is in your traditional sense a flop but a big success. That's why it feels scary. Yeah, it's weird. There's no no easy answers. And that, ladies and gentlemen of Travolting Podcast is why the unions are striking. Yes. <laughs> that is why it is so important if that if what we just said sounds absolutely confusing to you exactly <laughs> <laughs> yes um uh support the unions please uh continue to support sag wga dga iatsi um they're gonna save this industry hopefully Thus we hope yes um that's that's honestly all the post texter is there is nope i'm gonna predict that this movie's gonna get a lot of oscar nominations I think that's a pretty simple, easy bet to make. Yeah. Do you want to even go on record and say what? Um, Leo's going to get nominated. He's not going to win. De Niro Lily, get nominated? De Niro's going to get nominated. Um, I think the- Lily Gladstone? Lily Gladstone's going to get nominated. I think she might win, unless there's something that really blows. What do you think she's going to get nominated for? Actress or supporting? She's running for actress. Oh, um, you already know she's yes, running for Yes, she it? is running for best actress. Okay. Um, Best supporting actor this year is going to go to the one of the two Robert D's, and it's a uh, question of which one. <laughs> so they go to De Niro or Downey Jr., and I don't know which one. Yeah, best picture. I think best picture. Best I screenplay. Think, probably. I think Oppenheimer's going to win more. I think it's kind of quote unquote Nolan's year. Um, the I, Oscars. I see this getting adapted. This yeah, this adapted could get screenplay. Adapted. The thing about the Oscars is that it is at the end of the day, it's show business it's a popularity contest it's it's popular kind of it's also show business and that they love narratives they yeah. love a story yeah you know what they love christopher nolan you love him he's never won an oscar before you know what it's his time they love that story they loved when marty won for the departed they loved martin's chris says he's never won an oscar you know what it's time to give him one yeah and that was the most transparent shit i've ever seen in my life when for best picture George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Francis Ford Coppola walked out on stage to present best um, director as if Martin Scorsese was not going to win. Right. It was so transparent that, I mean, like, who knew they could have opened that envelope and could have said anything. They don't rig it, as we learned with Chadwick Boseman um, in 2021. Hmm? They, the, for the first time, they changed up the order in 2021 of announcements and put best actor after best picture. Because oh. it seemed like Chadwick Boseman, who had passed away, was going to win for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Yeah. But he didn't. Instead, Anthony Hopkins won, who was not present at the ceremony. Oh. So they changed up the entire order of the show. And Joaquin Phoenix came out and he opened up the envelope. He's like, 
Anthony Hopkins uh, for the father. Um, he's not here. His, um, the Academy will accept the award on his behalf. That's a great show. Thank you for a great night. And it just cut to credits. It was so awkward. Um, wow. So even though they can they can kind of frame these narratives, sometimes things just get thrown uh, out of out of whack. It is crazy the amount of nomination scores as he has, and yeah. only one win. Yeah, one win for The Departed. I think he deserves another, and I think this movie would be a justifiable one to yes. do. Yes, this movie, if he won for this movie, it would not feel like a. It's your turn win. Yeah, I would. Does not, that make sense? Yeah, like, and I fully would not be upset if he won for this. Right. It wouldn't be like, oh, they're handing him a participation trophy. No, like if he won for this movie, I feel like it'd be totally justified. I, on a personal, would have given him an award. I would have. He was my winner for 2019 for the Irishman. I love the Irishman. I'm an Irishman. Who did win in 2018? Um, Bong Joon Ho won best Parasite. picture for Parasite. Oh, and Sam. Um, Sam Mendes went for 1917. 17. Give Marty the award. Fuck Sam Mendes. No, Sam Mendes is fine. I have no problems with that man. Um, give it to Marty. Yeah. Um, what does Cole Bradley think about this movie? Has he seen it yet? Oh, he actually gave me something to read on record. I'm, aren't you so glad I reminded you? Brought it up, yes. Um, yeah, Cole Bradley, who unfortunately could not be here today um, to talk about this movie, did send me something to read on record. He said... <clears throat> Uh, Brendan looking like a fucked up fish living at the bottom of the ocean. Listen to above the title, the best and only mu- movie podcast. <laughs> that was his statement. I'm just, I feel so sorry. <laughs> I feel so sorry for the sad existence that Cole Bradley has to live in. <laughs> Pour one out for Cole Bradley's sad movie takes. Sad movie takes. But he uh, liked this movie, I'm bet. Yeah, he liked this. Movie. Yeah. Um, he does. He does just like two ruffle feathers. I know. Um. But yeah, I think that's all I have to say. That's all I have to say. Um, we, we, I think this is gonna be this is definitely gonna be over two hours. I think this is our longest episode with just the two of us, perhaps. Yeah, I think because so. there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, I'm kind of glad we didn't have a guest this week because I think it would have been really hard to wrangle this movie with. It really would have been. Yeah. Um, it's also good to just kind of finish out the podcast yeah. with just the two. Like I agree, just the two of us kind of. This is also the best current release movie we've covered. <laughs> Unless you really want to go at bat for Die Hard, Paradise City, or Mobland. Wait, wait, say that again? I think this is the best like current release movie we've talked about. Current release yeah. movie. I thought you were going to say like like pl- plop in the whale yeah. with that. And I was going to be like, well, I do like this movie a lot. And yeah. I, 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 I won't, I'm not going to make comparisons for this in the whale, yeah. but like. I mean, you can't, but I yeah. do like this movie. Very lot. different movies. Yeah. Um, I adored this movie. Um, I am so glad we got to talk about it. I'm even gladder that it got made. I'm very glad it timed out the way it did. Yes. The podcast. Hope, really, this timed out really strangely weird. Yeah. Um, that this movie comes out right as we finish up Brendan. Yeah. Um, who I am was thrilled to see in this movie, uh, and I can't wait for more of his career, um, which we'll be talking about next week. Uh, because we're we'll be back next week for a final episode of the Fraser's Edge retrospective. Retrospective. We're looking back at his uh, the auteurist era. You said it. Um, to commit to it. And also looking forward. Um, and then on a general sense, we're looking at the whole picture, kind of discussing his entire career up to this point. Yeah. Uh, so make sure you tune in next week for that. Um, I promise this to be a fun episode. I think we're recording it right after this. Might be a slightly shorter episode because I think we are tired. But you know what? We're gonna we're gonna talk about it all anyway. Um. Thank you so much for listening this week. Um, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. As a reminder, we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Um, pop to our Reddit, r slash Travolting, at Travolting Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky Threads. Find me on Twitter, at Jeff W. Sweeney. Uh, I'm on Instagram. You already know what it is. You do. Uh, special thanks, as always, to Rebecca Johnson for the graphic design, Michael Van Bodegum Smith for the theme music. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please... Go out and see Killers of the Flower Moon in theaters. It's well worth your time. You will not regret it. In theaters, we beg you. Yes. Um, Have a great week, folks. See you next week for our final Fraser's Edge episode.